Uh, good morning. Uh, the committee will come to order. I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Uh, and I, we are pleased to, uh, today to welcome the Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, Mr. Michael Chertoff. We are holding this hearing pursuant to our oversight responsibilities regarding certain offices and programs at the Department of Homeland Security that fall within uh, the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. The Homeland Security Committee has jurisdiction over the organization and administration of this department generally, uh, overall homeland security policy, and a number of specified security issues. But our hearing will focus not on the department and its mission broadly, but instead more narrowly on matters relating to criminal law enforcement functions, such as at the Secret Service and the Air Marshals, to name two, immigration policy and non-border enforcement, uh, privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties protections as they pertain to the department's responsibilities. That focus should guide our discussion and our questions this morning. I believe this is a particularly important time for us to be conducting this hearing, and I hope we will explore a variety of topics, and I'll touch on just a couple uh, now related to immigration policy and enforcement. At a hearing last month in the Immigration Subcommittee, we heard a number of re uh, reports of raids and removals in apparent neglect of basic due process and Fourth Amendment protections. One was a 15-year-old girl in Georgia who walked out of her bedroom to find armed ICE agents had entered her home without permission while her mother was out. If they had a warrant, they never showed it to her. She was a U.S.-born citizen, as was her mother. There are also reports of ICE failing to provide basic medical care to immigration detainees, of detainees with HIV or other serious chronic conditions deprived of life-saving medications or needed diagnostic procedures during extended periods of detention. In one instance, <laughs> doctors' requests for a biopsy uh, for a detainee were repeatedly denied over a period of 10 months. By the time the uh, individual was finally permitted to get the biopsy, the cancer had spread and was incurable. Meanwhile, there is a growing backlog of naturalization cases despite heights and fees with the promise to speed the process up. I expect our members to have a variety of questions for you, Mr. Secretary, and I appreciate your being with us. There is a strong interest here in your department's work and in helping ensure that in the areas of our jurisdiction you have the resources and the commitment to do that work. I would now recognize our ranking member, Lamar Smith of Texas, for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I join you in welcoming uh, Mr. Secretary to, I think, his first appearance before the House Judiciary uh, Committee. Since its creation, the Department of Homeland Security has made significant strides in revitalizing immigration enforcement efforts that had been left to languish under both Democratic and Republican administrations. Now, I'm especially appreciative of the renewed attention to worksite enforcement, alien fugitive apprehension, and criminal alien removal. However, we cannot forget all the work that is left to do. There are still 7 million illegal immigrants working in the United States, and DHS estimates that there are 605,000 foreign-born aliens incarcerated in state and local facilities, half of whom are illegal immigrants. Given the current state of the economy, securing American jobs is more important now than ever. DHS's continued worksite enforcement efforts are critical to promoting the American economy and protecting the American worker. Companies which had long relied on illegal immigrant labor are for the first time in years raising wages, improving working conditions, and recruiting more American workers. To enforce immigration laws and keep America safe, Congress must grant DHS additional tools. For example, DHS needs the Basic Pilot Program, or E-Verify, to be reauthorized and made mandatory so that DHS can finally turn off the job magnet for illegal immigration. And DHS needs to have the ability to detain dangerous criminal aliens and keep them off our streets. However, DHS's first goal must be to secure the border. So I am disappointed by the administration's failure to seek funding for anywhere near the number of immigration detention beds and interior enforcement agents that Congress called for in the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004. The administration may have ended catch and release for non-Mexicans along the southern border, but catch and release is alive and well in the interior of the U.S. Most illegal 
aliens picked up in the interior of the country or released the next day due to lack of detention space this and other forms of catch and release in the interior will only be ended by a dramatic increase in immigration detention beds and interior enforcement agents i regret that the administration has not implemented an exit control system for immigrants more than a decade after congress called for its creation and i am disappointed by the administration's unwillingness to cut off visas to countries that do not accept back their citizens over a hundred thousand who have been ordered deported from the u.s and i'm also disappointed by the administration's failure to require the social security administration and the internal revenue service to share information with dhs that could make dhs's job of immigration enforcement so much easier and mr secretary i think you may share my disappointment in that area finally i am disappointed that only a hundred and sixty seven miles of physical fencing are being built along the southern border and i'm disappointed that the administration is not choosing to build more double fencing i look forward to the administration's addressing these and other concerns and i look forward to hearing uh, from Mr. Chertoff today on ways to continue to make immigration law enforcement more effective. Uh, Madam Chairman, America has the most generous immigration system in the world. We admit over one million legal immigrants every year. So I don't think it's too much to ask that our laws, our borders, and our sovereignty be respected by others. And uh, before I yield back my time, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, say that uh, um, I know it was uh, 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 unpreventable, uh, but many Republicans are not here right now because of a Republican uh, conference that was all but mandatory, and I expect that we will have a number of members show up in just 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that, unfortunately, I have a suspension bill on the floor, and at some point this morning I'll have to uh, uh, absent myself and go handle that suspension vote, and I'll regret missing a part of your uh, testimony and responses, Mr. Secretary, as well. With that, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Uh, <clears throat> the gentleman yields back. And if uh, we could recess this hearing until 10:15, yes, uh, oh. uh, the end of the conference, but I thought that we there was an interest in proceeding. So, so the interest is in proceeding then. All right, then we will we will proceed. And uh, thank you, without objection, other members' opening statements will be included in the record, and we would now turn to Secretary Chertoff and uh, invite him to uh, uh, give us his statement. Welcome, uh, Secretary Chertoff. Uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Lofgren and Congressman Smith and other members of the committee, and I, I ask that <coughs> I have a full written statement which was submitted that I ask be... With, without objection, the full statement will be made part of the record. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the department's uh, continued efforts to secure the country and protect the American people. Uh, I appreciate this committee's role in providing <coughs> guidance on the issue of uh, immigration. Um, and together with the strong support and partnership that uh, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member King have given this department through their uh, oversight on the House Homeland Security Committee, which is our, our authorizing committee, uh, we're able to work together in partnership with Congress to enhance uh, our national security. As you know, this is the fifth anniversary week of the department. And over the last five years, we have, in fact, made enormous strides in building national capabilities, plans, and partnerships to defend our country against all hazards. I've divided uh, our mission into five basic priority goals. Protecting our nation <coughs> from dangerous people, protecting our nation from dangerous things or goods, protecting our critical infrastructure, uh, strengthening our emergency preparedness and response capabilities, and integrating our management and operations. Today, I'd like to focus my testimony on our substantial progress toward these goals, focused on the issue of our effort to secure the border and manage immigration. Last August, Secretary Carlos Gutierrez and I laid out 26 reforms the administration would pursue to address the nation's immigration challenges within the framework of our existing laws. We've made substantial progress to these goals, although we have not yet achieved them, and I'd like to highlight some of that work today. Let me begin at the border, because um, uh, immigration, the challenge of immigration and illegal immigration uh, begins at the border, although it does not end at the border. In the time that has intervened, particularly since we announced our Secure Border Initiative in 2006, 
<clears throat> we have made dramatic increases, adding fencing, border patrol, and technology between the ports of entry, and we have also made significant steps in tightening the travel document requirements and other security measures that apply at our ports of entry, including the use of biometrics in the transition from a two-print biometric system to a 10-fingerprint biometric system, which is currently underway not only overseas at our consulates, but here at our airports of entry. We've constructed 303 miles of fencing along the southern border, including about 168 miles of pedestrian fencing and about 135 miles of vehicle fencing. This places us on target to have 670 miles of barriers uh, in place at the end of the year. And to give you some visual sense of what that means, that will mean that uh, the vast majority of the area from the Pacific Ocean to the Texas-New Mexico border will have some kind of a barrier in place uh, by the end of this year, except in those areas where there's a natural barrier, like a mountain or something of that sort. We are also, uh, we have currently expanded the Border Patrol to more than 15,500 agents, uh, with plans to reach over 18,000 by the end of the year. <coughs> Again, by way of comparison, when the President took office in 2001, we had somewhat over 9,000 agents. So we're going to have doubled the number of Border Patrol agents in this intervening period of time. We've also continued to deploy technology to the border as part of our secure border initiative, SBI Net. And here, um, because of a, a kind of a triumph of inaccurate press reporting, I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, lay out, in fact, what we are doing technologically at the southwest border. SBI Net is a, a strategy of using a number of different kinds of technological systems to enhance the ability of the Border Patrol to identify people illegally crossing the border and to apprehend them. This includes things such as unmanned aerial vehicles. We took delivery of the fourth unmanned aerial vehicle about two weeks ago. These are UAVs cruise above the border with cameras, and I have personally witnessed how they I, allow us to identify groups of illegal aliens in, in remote areas or groups of drug smugglers in remote areas so that we can communicate with ground or air-based Border Patrol assets in order to intercept and apprehend these smugglers. Our technology also involves the use of ground sensors, and we will have in place more than 7,500 ground sensors uh, by the end of this fiscal year. It also includes what we call mobile surveillance systems. And again, I've had the opportunity to witness these work. These are basically radar systems and camera systems that are in place on vehicles that can be situated at various places of the border. Uh, and we, we currently have about half a dozen. By the end of this year, we'll be at 40. So these systems uh, are working. They produce real value. We are expanding them, and we will continue to expand them. One element of the strategy is the development of an integrated approach to using fixed-based radar and cameras along a swath of border. We began the process of uh, testing this approach through a prototype system that we deployed along 28 miles of the border in, Sasseb in the vicinity of Sasabe, Arizona. This is known as Project 28. Some people have misconceived Project 28 as the entirety of SBI Net. I would say the more accurate way to describe it is uh, Project 28 is as to SBI Net as a single battle cruiser is to the United States Navy's fleet. It is an element of the capability, but is not the entirety of the capability. This project, Project 28, was delayed about five months, five to six months uh, before acceptance due to some problems with the technology. Uh, when the problems arose last summer, I, had a, I personally had a conversation with the CEO of Boeing, uh, which I would describe as a, an unvarnished conversation, in which I told him that <clears throat> we were not wedded to using this approach, and that if the approach could not be made to work properly, we would not pursue it any further. Uh, to his credit, he, re he overhauled the team that was working on the project, uh, the, most of the material problems were corrected by December. We took conditional acceptance. Uh, we began to work with it directly and operationally. Uh, the remaining material problems were corrected. 
uh, un immaterial problems were dealt with by our receiving a credit, uh, and w the additional effort and time put into fixing the system, uh, the money for that was eaten by Boeing. We didn't pay extra. It was a $20 million system, and we paid $20 million less the, cre less the credits we got. The system is now functional and working. I have asked the Border Patrol. I have looked them in the eye from the chief of the Border Patrol down to the project manager to the senior um, uh, people at the border. I have said to them, does this add value? Because if it doesn't, I'm happy to use the, all the other tools that we have. And they have looked me in the eye and they have said it does add value. Now, we need to take it to the next level, and that is what we're in the process of doing. And we expect to begin further deployments uh, this year in 2008 and other parts of Tucson, a, a sector at the border. At the ports of entry, we recently ended the practice of accepting oral declarations of uh, citizenship. Uh, this actually received a little bit of controversy, although I frankly thought the remarkable thing was that we had ever accepted oral declarations. Uh, but we have ended the practice. This will reduce false claims of U.S. citizenship. We have ended the practice without causing large backups at the border. And in fact, there's been a very high level of compliance with our new document requirements. Let me take the opportunity to um, address this issue of identification documents in the larger context of the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, which Congress has now uh, delayed implementation of until June 2009, and in the context of the Real ID Act. It is my conviction, based upon what I have observed every time we have made secure documents available to the American public, that the public wants secure documents. Uh, the the uh, enhanced driver's license, which the state of Washington has recently begun to issue, which is real ID compliant and which will be uh, witty compliant, these are going like hotcakes. People want it. All we have to do is give it to them, and they will. The market will will uh, will operate. So I propose we continue to move along this course. Uh, as uh, Congressman Smith noted, interior enforcement is a critical element of this uh, process because the economic engine that brings people into the country is the largest factor in controlling illegal immigration. I set a new record last year with 863 criminal arrests in worksite enforcement cases, including 92 people in the employer supervisory chain. And we had a further 4, 000, over 4,000 administrative arrests. Uh, let me say that just in the last couple of days, Richard Rosenbaum, the former president of a contract cleaning service who we arrested last year for harboring illegal aliens and for conspiracy to defraud the U.S. and harbor illegal aliens, was sentenced to 10 years in prison. 10 years in prison is a sentence that will get an employer's attention because it is comparable to the kinds of sentences that serious felons get for other kinds of crimes. So we're going to continue moving forward with this. We have raised the fines. We've worked with the Department of Justice to raise fines against employers by 25 percent. Uh, E-Verify, again, is a system that is the marketplace is speaking. Uh, we are adding oh, between one and 2,000 employers a week to the system. We're up to more than 54,000 nationwide. I, I joined Congressman Smith in urging Congress to reauthorize a system that employers want because it allows them to follow the law. That is what they want to do, the vast majority of them. Finally, let me say that ICE has removed <clears throat> more than 31,000 fugitives in fiscal year 2007, nearly double the previous year, and initiated removal proceedings against 164,000 illegal aliens in U.S. jails in 2007, which is, is as compared to 70,000 the prior year. So we are dramatically ramping up our removals, um, although I agree with Congressman Smith that some countries uh, are not being cooperative, and we have to find a way to address this issue. Uh, we want to continue to build on this progress, which the President's proposed budget in 2009 would do. Finally, we recognize that there is a need uh, for labor in certain sectors of the economy that has previously been satisfied through the use of undocumented workers that we're going to have to find a lawful way to satisfy. And that's why last month Secretary Chow and I proposed changes to the H-2A seasonal agricultural worker program to allow employers to have a legal way to bring temporary workers in to perform agricultural work. And we want to work with Congress to modify some other programs like the H-2B program, which are lawful ways people can come into the country and work. 
So with these efforts <coughs> and others, we hope to continue to build the kinds of capabilities that will uh, move us forward uh, toward a, an immigration system that is uh, protective of American interests, that is fair, but that respects the rule of law, and that also deals with legitimate economic needs that we have in this country. Uh, thank you for hearing me, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We will now move to a question by <coughs> members of the committee, and I will begin. Um, as you are aware, I spend uh, much of my time here in Congress on my assignment as chair of the Immigration Subcommittee. And one of the things that has become clear to us is that we, um, we have a problem uh, with service members and their families, uh, particularly now in this time of war. It seems to me we, we really, there's no greater duty that we, we owe than to those men and women who are serving in our armed services, especially in a combat zone. And the last thing we want to do is to add stress to, to them uh, at a time of their service. Now, <coughs> I've recently been advised that USCIS has issued a number of notices to appear to soldiers and sailors uh, for deportation because of paperwork uh, glitches. And for example, uh, if one is uh, the recipient of a petition based on marriage to an American citizen, uh, there's a condition on, on the permanent residence that is removed after two years, and you have to file a piece of paper to remove the condition. But because we allow uh, soldiers and sailors to naturalize on a more expeditious basis, uh, the Army has suggested that you just proceed on the uh, naturalization uh, petition. But uh, in, in, instead of that, uh, we've issued deportation orders to our soldiers. And I, I'm very concerned also about family members. We had uh, a sailor appear uh, before our subcommittee uh, last year. He came in his Navy whites, and uh, his wife was undocumented, and he was about to be deployed for the third time to the Gulf. And he told us in his testimony that he is having a hard time concentrating on his work defending our country because he was so worried about whether his wife would be deported while he was uh, deployed to, to the Gulf. So I think we need legislation to address these situations, and I'm working on that right now. But I think there are some things that your department can do in the interim to help our soldiers and family members in those circumstances. For example, last year, Specialist Alex Jimenez was serving in Iraq. He was attacked and listed as missing. His wife was undocumented and was facing deportation. And the department, your department, granted her par parole to avoid her deportation, allow her to adjust her status and get a green card. Can you advise us what steps you are prepared to take while we're working on legislation to make sure that the husbands and wives of our soldiers don't get deported while they're serving? <coughs> You know, I, I, I th it's very hard to generalize. I, first of all, I share your appreciation for the uh, <coughs> work that service people do. I, I was in Iraq last year, and I got to participate in a naturalization ceremony uh, for service members who had come from all over the world. Um, I, I think we want to be uh, a, a, as fair and as considerate as possible of service people. Now, I, it depends. I can't generalize as to why sometimes a family member is deportable. Where if it's merely a paperwork violation or a glitch in something that prevents someone who would otherwise entitled to be entitled to adjust, uh, if there's some technical issue where they've missed it, you know, some piece of paperwork, we can often, we should work to address those issues. If there's some more substantive reason someone's going to be deported, then that may not be something we can address. So well, we, it, I think we need to be practical and humane about it. Could you, if not today, get back to us? Because it just seems to me the last thing we want is, is notices to appear being issued to our soldiers in I, the field. I, I mean, I we've mean, got to stop yeah, that. I, I agree. And, and so some, uh, certainly that, that's the kind of thing, uh, <clears throat> you know, w I think we can correct. You know, I, uh, will something slip through the cracks sometime? Experience tells me that in a large organization with many, many transactions, a few things slip through the cracks. But I agree with your basic principle, your basic uh, let, let me turn to another question. I understand that the department is actively considering 
an extension of the optional practical training program known as OPT for students. And uh, I've written you a letter, in fact, asking that the OPT be extended for up to 29 months. I think this is one of the easiest things, ways to make sure that uh, the there's reform to the visa programs, and especially as it relates to highly skilled individuals, which I know from our prior discussions you feel is an important component of immigration uh, to America. Now, it's important if we're going to do this that this regulation be issued before graduation uh, this spring so that employers and, and graduating students can make their plans. I'm hoping that we can, if we're going to do this, we can do it promptly. And I want to talk about a rumor that I've heard that OPT would be conditioned on mandatory E-Verify, which seems to me unnecessary because E-Verify will not give us any more information on these students than we already have. Uh, all of these students are already tracked through SEVIS, which DHS runs, and they're already work authorized because we've give them, given them their work authorization. So I'm just hoping that this simple idea doesn't sink with additional um, uh, mandates that actually won't provide any additional information to the department except just paperwork. Can you address those two issues? Well, A, I agree. We, I think we do want to get this new regulation out uh, as, in as timely a way as possible. Uh, as you know, because under the law, because it's in the regulatory process, uh, if I were to start to you know, identify specific issues and talk about them, I would pretty much guarantee being in court and the whole thing would get derailed. So. We, we take seriously all the comments we get. We take them on board, and um, we will try to get this thing out as quickly as possible. All right. Uh, I'll turn now to Mr. Smith for his uh, questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you again for being here uh, and appearing before us. It so happens that I think you've got the second toughest job in all the federal government, although I realize the Attorney General may question that. Uh, but still uh, appreciate your answering questions. Um, I want to ask uh, uh, some questions in regard to securing the border. Uh, as you know, the Secure Fence Act required 700 miles of double fencing. Uh, and it's my understanding, and that was made optional by a Senate amendment to the omnibus bill. And it's my understanding that now the plan is to build about 30 miles of double fencing of that 700 miles of other kinds of fencing. Is that correct? <laughs> I think we, uh, <coughs> I can't tell you, I think we may now have about 30 miles of double fencing. We're, we're, we're committed to doing, by the end of this calendar year, is 670 miles of. Right. And then how much of that will be double fencing? Uh, I, I don't have an answer figure for that because I think we're going to make a decision after we build this based on the advice of the Border Patrol okay. where double fencing makes sense and where it doesn't make sense. Okay. Do you consider pedestrian fencing and vehicle barriers to be as effective as double fencing? Uh, in many areas, yeah, I do. You think that will stop, uh, double fencing stops about 99.5% of I, traffic? I, I disagree. I, I don't think double fencing stops anybody. All fencing does is slow people up. Yeah. Well, when they've had double fencing in San Diego, it's my understanding that there was a virtual halt to where the f I mean, to people coming over the fences. That that no. Here's what here's what the ground truth is. Um, the double fencing slowed people up. Now, where there was nothing going on in other parts of the border, uh, the smugglers moved to a, a place which was easier. That's just right. common sense. As we've actually built up in other parts of the border, the number of people sneaking across in the San Diego sector has gone up again slightly. I can tell you people go through the fencing, they go over the fencing, they go under the fencing. Now, that doesn't mean the fencing doesn't have value. Yeah. Uh, it slows people and, up. And you, the border and you, patrol and, and you think the, f the pedestrian fences, for example, are as effective as the double fences? I think in many areas uh, it, it is as effective because um, if you're out in the desert, the marginal value of the second layer of fence to slow somebody up for 15 minutes is really, frankly, useless in terms of the Border Patrol's ability to get someplace. Okay. What are your plans for the other 1,300 miles of our southern border? You've mentioned the 670 miles. Uh, what are your plans for the remainder? It's going gonna, it's gonna to vary, f as you know, because you're from Texas, Congressman. Uh -huh. There are large parts of the border that have a river <coughs> that uh, uh, create a barrier and make it hard to cross. But I've, now, seen, the, I've seen the Rio Grande both dry and at six right. inches. And it that's right. And so I've watched people splash across as they run. So. That's right. So in some places, we are building fences in Texas. Yeah. And I, I know you know that that is not a matter without controversy. 
Right. So the answer is we're going to do a mix of things, and we will build uh, additional fencing and barriers beyond the 670 miles in some areas. In some areas, we're, we will rely upon cameras and sensors. The virtual fence? Uh, we're gonna, we may cut some of the Carrizo cane down, which will uh, create an unobstructed view in some areas. And it's, it's going to, in some areas where there's a mountain, it's really, uh, you know, pretty much a natural barrier. Mr. It's Secretary, how much of the 2,000-mile southern border do you have plans to somehow have some type of system in place to guard against? We will eventually have a system in place on every mile. It's going to vary depending on what the mile is. Okay. And when would that system be in place for the 2,000 miles? I, um, I, I would expect that we will have, well, of course, we have something in place now almost everywhere, so we're going to continue to improve it and build it. Um, I would imagine a lot of work will be done over the next two years to, to fully deploy technology, okay. the next generation. But you, you don't know when you would finish. Mean, it may go beyond this administration, so you really can't say when. I, I, right. I can tell you where we're going to be at the end of this calendar year. Um, okay. We're going to have over 7,500 sensors, 670 miles of fencing, right. uh, the other right. technical systems I've talked about. Right. I, um, I, I, I understand that, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for those answers. Let me squeeze in one more question, and that is, to your credit, uh, the number of removals of criminal aliens has dramatically uh, gone up. But it's still my understanding that uh, those criminal aliens who are now incarcerated in state and local jails uh, um, the vast majority of, of, of those individuals will still be released into our communities this year. Is that an accurate statement? I, w I would not, I don't know that I can, I would agree that the vast majority of people incarcerated will be released this no, year. I didn't say vast majority, I just said a majority. Well, I, don't, I don't know that I would say a majority will be increased this year because I don't think their sentences are all going to expire this year. Okay, well of those whose sentences expire then, will the majority be released into our communities? I, I, I don't know that I could say that either. What I do agree with you though that we are not at the point now where we can deport everybody. And we did get a... Um, I know you're working on that, but I was looking for it today. It's my understanding from the Inspector General that over half are still released into our communities. I know you're working on it. I know you're improving it. But I, uh, uh, do you agree or disagree with that statement or that? I, I, guess, I guess it's hard. I, I can't verify that statement. I, I okay. know there, there's supposed to be uh, you know, several hundred thousand uh, illegal... Uh, aliens in custody. Since I don't, uh, since I'm assuming that their sentences don't all expire in one year, I can't tell you how many would get out that wouldn't be covered by our program. So um, okay. I, I, I can't dis I can't disagree. I can't agree with this statement. Okay. I just thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, and w I will now recognize the uh, chair of our Constitution Subcommittee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Secretary. In February of 2003, Congress provided a billion dollars in 9-11 assist disaster assistance to FEMA in the words of the statute, quote, to establish a captive insurance company or other appropriate insurance mechanism for claims arising for debris removal, from debris removal, which may include claims made by city employees, close quote. The purpose of the fund was to remove the financial burden from the city while providing compensation to those working at Ground Zero who had been injured thereby. FEMA subsequently signed a grant agreement with the City of New York, establishing the World Trade Center Captive Insurance Company to handle 9-11 claims. Unfortunately, the World WTCC has argued that it has, quote, a duty to defend every claim and has litigated every single claim in federal court. Congressional intent was to pay claims, not to fight claims. They have spent, so far, over $50 million in legal fees and $45,000 in claims to someone who fell off a ladder and broke his arm. There are about 10,000 lawsuits pending, or 10,000 claimants uh, who have suffered health uh, or claim to have suffered health effects from the pollution at 9-11, mostly first responders. Now, since FEMA reports to DHS, are you doing any oversight on the captive insurance company to see that it does its job and not? Uh, um, <clears throat> I guess I have a question for the chair. I, I, I recognize there's a lot of latitude in committee hearings, but I actually thought the subject matter and the jurisdictional basis for the hearing was immigration. <laughs> uh, <coughs> you know, I know there, I know our main authorizing committee uh, uh, has jurisdiction, obviously, over the whole department. And I, I guess I, my question is, is this a kind of an, it, maybe it's an old... Actually, the Judiciary Committee does have jurisdiction over claims. Um, I, I, so the short answer is not having 
anticipated being asked about this captive insurance company. I'm not in a position to give you an answer. But All right. Well, could you uh, please answer, give us an answer in the next couple of weeks in, in, in yeah. two, in, to two questions. What are you doing about oversight on the captive insurance company? And do you believe that Congress provided this money to fight the, to fight the claims of the heroes of 9-11? Because essentially what they're doing is they say that their duty is to is, is that they're there to protect the city and the contractors and that they must litigate every single claim. It's sort of like an insurance company that says uh, if, you, uh, if, if, if you get into a car accident, we won't pay you unless you sue us first. Not that we'll investigate it and decide whether to pay you, but automatically you've got to bring a lawsuit, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and we've been dealing with this now for three years, uh, uh, $50 million in legal fees, $45,000 paying out one claim. It's I don't think that was the congressional intent. So, and it is under your jurisdiction. Right. You did give the money, so I, I hope you'll take a, a look. I'll, at I'll, that. I'll find out about it. Thank you. Secondly, uh, my second question um, has nothing to do with that. You'll be relieved to know. Um, this uh, going to uh, the so-called uh, uh, rendition case uh, cases. In this case, the RR case. I'm sure you're familiar with that, the Mahara RR case. Yeah. Which was a case. Some people say it was another example of uh, extraordinary rendition, and the department has said that, no, 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 this was an expedited removal because Mr. Arar in coming to Kennedy Airport, even though he was coming only to switch planes to, to continue on to Kennedy, was entering the country, and rather than enter the country, we shipped him off to Syria. Um, with having gotten assurances from the Syrian government that they wouldn't torture him, assurances which were subsequently not honored. Now, a week ago, Representative Delahunt and I sent a letter to you asking for specific information as to the diplomatic assurances given in the RR case and, to, and as to the extent to which they complied with, that is, those assurances complied with regulations implementing the obligations of the United States under Article Three of the Convention Against Torture. So I, and now, we have not received an, a, a, a response, but we only sent that letter to you about a week, a week and a half ago. But I do ask if you'll commit to us to <coughs> provide a response to Representative Delahunt and myself uh, within the next uh, uh, 10 days or so. I, I guess the only question I have is, I, I, you know, DHS didn't exist during the time of this case. Um, so I don't know whether the appropriate, reci the, the appropriate recipient of that request is the Department of Justice or, or the Department of, of Homeland well, Security. I, I, I know INS was, was, uh, is now, the, the legacy of INS is now in DHS. But I think that um, I, get, I guess we're going to have to sort out with the Attorney General who the well, right Well, there are really two questions. Sort out with the Attorney General. It may be that, that you should delegate part of the answer to him. Uh, uh, but, but I also ask that you commit to providing the committee with, and this would be your, what I'm about to say would be your department, with copies of regulations or other guidance promulgated by or applicable to DHS that, as required by the Foreign Affairs Reform and Restructuring Act of 1998, assure compliance with the Convention Against Torture. All right. Well, whatever is within our domain, we will, we will supply. I see that my time has run out, so thank you very much. Uh, the um, prior chairman of the uh, committee, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, is now recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to ask a couple questions that uh, would require only a yes or no answer. First one is, is, is the basic pilot program relative to verification of Social Security numbers working or not? Uh, yes, we call it E-Verify, but it does work. Okay. Uh, the second subset is, is E-Verify working? Yes. I mean, a basic pilot is now E-Verify. Okay. So it, it's the same thing. Okay. Now, um, as I was driving in this morning, I was listening to uh, my favorite morning talk show. Uh, uh, NPR? No, sir. <laughs> yes, again. Uh, 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 our former colleague, Fred Grandy, uh, uh, was, is more of a repository of wisdom now that he's not in Congress than when he was. And he was talking about uh, an incident in Prince William County in the last week where they have a new program relative to cracking down on illegal immigrants. and. Uh, apparently, the Prince William County Police uh, identified four illegal immigrants 
uh, in that county who were stopped either for traffic offenses or something else that was relatively minor and the uh, local law enforcement called up ICE and asked them to come and pick these folks up and ICE refused. Why is that? I don't, I don't know the specifics of the case. I can tell you in general, uh, like everybody else, um, there, there is some limit to resources. We try to respond to requests, but we may not be able to drop w what agents are doing at any given particular moment and go out to respond to a call. Mm. So we try to work with locals to find out an efficient way. So if there are a number of people who are illegal and they have a basis to hold them uh, until we get to a, a, a number that we can efficiently um, apprehend and remove, we, we work with it that way. Otherwise, we'd, we'd wind up literally running from pillar to post, and it would be hard to actually, for example, chase fugitives or criminal aliens or things of that sort. But uh, don't we expand the resources uh, in enforcing our immigration laws when a jurisdiction like Prince William County, Virginia, uh, authorizes its local law enforcement uh, uh, officers to check on the immigration status of people who are uh, stopped for other offenses, mainly traffic offenses? Actually, what we try to do in the first instance is, if they're willing to do it, is train them so they can do uh, some of the work themselves, and that uh, relieves us of the burden. Secondly, although we can take a little bit of account of kind of the um, traffic flow, uh, we still, there is a finite, there are a finite number of agents, and uh, if we put, you know, a lot of agents in, in Prince William County, they're coming out of, but, uh, you know, other places. But w w with all due respect, Mr. Secretary, you don't need more agents. You know, here you had local law enforcement, they picked four people up, they called up ICE, said come and pick them up and hopefully put them in removal proceedings, and ICE was too busy. So, you know, it, it really didn't require an awful lot of work for uh, ICE agents to do that. Uh, I, I, I guess where we're disagreeing slightly is you still have to send a couple of agents over a distance yeah. uh, for a certain amount of time. It's going to, I mean, I can tell you from my own experience working with police over the years, you know, it probably winds up being somewhere between half a day and a day of work for a couple of agents. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just observing practically there's, you know, we're trying to juggle. Even with additional resources, we still have more demand than supply. Do you know the message that you're sending to local communities that want to help enforcing the immigration laws by saying, well, uh, what you're doing is really a low priority for us? No, that, that's, I, that's what you just said. I know. Here's the Let me be clear about what I said. I said, first of all, we'd love to help you uh, train you so you can do some of this yourself. But, you know, I find myself in the same position in answering that question that anybody who's been, made a career in law enforcement has. You don't, you're not able necessarily to prosecute or respond to every, every crime. Mm -hmm. When I was a prosecutor in New York, doing drug cases, we could not arrest every single low-level drug dealer, even though we wanted to. There just weren't enough agents and mm -hmm. there weren't enough prosecutors. So we made choices about who are the worst people and those are the people you go after. Now, as we get more resources, we can do more, and that's what we're doing. Well, I, I, I grant you that, but again, listening to what, what was on the radio this morning as I was driving in, uh, the taxpayers of Prince William County, Virginia, are spending their own money uh, to try to identify illegal immigrants and to put them into the judicial process so that they would be removed from the country. Uh, in my opinion, that's an expansion of resources uh, on that. And I believe that the election for county commission in that county last fall, uh, that was a major <coughs> issue and the voters reelected the people who wanted to crack down on uh, illegal immigration. Now, immigration is a federal issue. Right. And uh, I think we all realize that. But, uh, Mr. Secretary, you have got to do a better job of coordinating your resources with those local jurisdictions that want to spend their own money and their own personnel to try to enforce the immigration law rather than simply doing what ICE did, and that's blowing off Prince William County's officials. My time is up, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We would now. Um, invite the chair of the crime uh, subcommittee, Mr. Bobby Scott of Virginia, to begin his questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, how many senior staff, members of your senior staff, are with you today? Uh, um, I guess. Uh, Could they stand I mean, up? I guess maybe one. 
Uh, the, we have the general counsel with me. And uh, uh, do, you have other, do you have other members of the yeah, of your got, department? Um, uh, some legislative staff people. I don't know if you consider them senior. Sure. Can, they, can, they, can, all, can, can all your staff stand up? I've, uh, I've got. Could you have yeah, all your staff stand up, please? My personal staff? Yeah, go stand up. Everybody from the department. Thank you. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them are ledge affairs. We've got a press guy here um, and other people with specific expertise. Thank you. Um, I, wanted, I represent an area where port security is a big deal. Um, some of our port people have indicated that they're having problems with port security grants because they've got to deal with several agents, FEMA, uh, TSA, DOJ. Um, each, each agency with their own particular regulations and processes. Are we, uh, is any effort being made to streamline the port security grant program? Yeah, I think it is actually streamlined. I, th I, I don't know why you'd be dealing with DOJ unless it's a separate grant. It's all done, the okay. grants. Um, okay, well, let me get the specifics and we'll get, um, I'll ask a more focused question. Um, uh, right now, you can't use the grants for personnel costs? Uh, that's largely true. There are some few exceptions. Okay. Uh, port security identification, um, how is that program? Uh, I, don't, I don't have the, we have tens of thousands of people who are currently enrolled in the TWIC program, and um, so it's proceeding very well. I've got a, a, something like, I think we're up 40 or 50 ports are now part of that process. And are the IDs being issued on an expedite, expedited? Yes. Um, consumer ID theft is a problem nationwide. Is that under your jurisdiction and the Secret Service? Uh, we do have some, we share jurisdiction over that. Now, one of the problems with consumer ID theft is that after the credit card is canceled and the person's account is reimbursed, nothing ever happens, and that's why the ID theft is such a lucrative practice. Um, are you pursuing consumer ID theft cases? We, we pursue ID theft cases in general. Uh, we don't have jurisdiction over consumer matters per se, but in the context of what we do with, for example, illegal immigrants, uh, we do have document and, be and benefit fraud task forces. Uh, we do make criminal cases involving identity theft. The case uh, involving the 10-year sentence I just mentioned in, grew out of an, uh, an investigation involving identity theft. Um, most ID theft is not even investigated, much less prosecuted. Is that true? I don't. I, I can't answer that. I'm, I'm not in a position to either agree or disagree with that. Okay. On the no-fly list, so there's watch lists. If someone gets their name on a no-fly list, is there any way to correct the information if it's not accurate? Yes. Uh, there's a redress process um, that TSA has that's both online and in person. Um, the, the biggest challenge we have is that under the current system, because we, ha we are not yet into the, what we call secure flight, uh, it is up to the, when we make a correction, we communicate it to the airlines. Some airlines do a good job of changing their records to reflect the correction. Some do not. And for tho those airlines that do not, the mistake sometimes continues to get repeated because we can't get the airline, either the airline's incapable or not interested in m making the effort in order to correct the, the problem. Once you get the list, each airline has to update the list? As yeah, the current system uh, is that we provide the list to the airlines and they run the list against their manifest. What we'd like to do is reverse the process. That's what we're trying to do is secure mm -hmm. flight. Good. Um, citizenship, many people who are properly documented and want to become citizens are having to wait. What is the wait time to become a citizen for a routine case and what is being done to eliminate the backlog? Uh, it's gone up um, because we had a doubling in the number of applications. We're in the process of hiring, I think, uh, 1,500 additional adjusters or something like that. Um, we're, doing, we're trying to deal with two separate issues. But One is simply the volume of intake, which requires us to um, hire more people to adjudicate the cases and also we're trying, you know, we're trying to, to uh, get from a paper-based system to an electronic-based system. The second and probably more difficult thing for a minority of people is the background check process because uh, for the FBI name check, many of the, uh, most people go through very quickly within, you know, a matter of a few months. 
But for some, if a name crops up in an old paper-based file, the FBI has to go back and hunt for the actual file. And uh, the, they, have, they are sometimes not capable of doing that within a reasonable period of time. So we are now, we've put more money into the name check process and we're working with the FBI to try to find a way to A, input a lot of those records into databases so they can be searched more readily, and B, we're trying to examine the system to see if there's any way we can um, make it more efficient. And that's the second obstacle. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize uh, the ranking member of the court's uh, subcommittee, Mr. Howard Coble of North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary, good to have you with us today. Mr. Secretary, I'm told that there may be as many as 600,000 fugitives in the United States illegally, and that there may be as few as 30,000 beds to detain them. Uh, let me ask you a two-part question, assuming these figures are correct. How are you approaching this dilemma, A, and has the administration budgeted for additional beds uh, to address the problem? Uh, we doubled, or I think more than doubled over the last year or so, the, what we call the Fugitive um, Apprehension Task Forces. And last year, we doubled the number of fugitives we apprehended. Um, we're also asking for more beds uh, in the 09 budget, which should get us up to 33,000. The limiting factor in apprehending fugitives is not the number of beds at this point, it's finding them. Fugitives, not surprisingly, hide, and it's a big country. So uh, we've added more teams to go hunt for them, uh, and I think that, and, and that is why we've been able to increase or double the number of fugitives we apprehend. But I think, uh, again, it's the, it's the sheer um, work involved in finding them that is the limiting factor. Is the 600 figure approximately correct? Uh, it, it sounds like it's about right, but I, I can't, again, I can't verify it or, or, or not. Mr. Secretary, put on your Coast Guard hat. You wear many hats at I DHS, I know. What challenges does the Coast Guard face in deterring illegal immigration over the nation's coast, uh, coast and waterways, and does the department have the necessary tools to prosecute alien smugglers? Uh, you're quite right, Congressman, that the Coast Guard actually does play an important role um, with respect to migrant smuggling. Uh, and that's particularly true uh, in the general area of the Southeast United States. Um, we do have the plans and capabilities, and on a regular basis, we deploy them to intercept illegal uh, migrants who are trying to come in by way of sea. Most often, it's not a question of prosecuting them, it's just a question of returning them to the place from which they came. Um, we do have capabilities, obviously, if necessary, to prosecute them uh, in the United States if we actually get a smuggler. But our preferred thing is just to send them back where they came from. Do, do you need additional tools to aid in the, the drug interdiction mission? Um, I, I think uh, at this point, um, working with the Navy, the Coast Guard does have, and we've gotten the budget some additional capabilities, does have the capabilities necessary to perform its mission, but we, we do rely upon the Department of Defense and Customs and Border Protection and Coast Guard also work together in terms of drug interdiction. And, I, and I'm told that the Coast Guard is responsible for a six million square mile area between the U.S., mainland, the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, and the Eastern Pacific, and I don't know how they accomplish that mission, sort of like your your bed situation with the fugitives. Well, they, they do a great job. There are a couple of things that help. Um, a, we do partner with the Navy, and that gives us additional capabilities. Second, the use of intelligence allows us to, uh, you know, more effectively deploy our resources. We had a record number of cocaine seizure, seizures last year, uh, including one very large seizure off a boat, but it is the ability to identify something that's coming based on intelligence that allows us to put our helicopters and our, our cutters where they need to be to intercept the, these vessels. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Madam Chair, I want you to award credit to me for yielding before the red light illuminates. Uh, credit will certainly be due. Uh, we turn now to the uh, other gentleman from North Carolina, uh, Mr. Watt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I presume that credit uh, spills over to the... It doesn't belong to the state, no. <laughs> to, the, to the rest of the state. Uh, Mr. Chertoff, um, um, uh, Mr. Scott made a point, but I don't, I'm not sure you understood the point, nor did the record get the uh, 
uh, purpose of his point uh, when he asked you to have your st staff stand up. Um, um, just for the record, uh, I think the point Mr. Scott was making, you brought uh, 10 staff people with you, all white males. Um, I hope, I know this hearing is not about diversity of, of the staff, uh, but I hope you've got more diversity in your staff than you, you have reflected here uh, in the people that you brought with you. Um, please reassure me that that is the case. Uh, um, I, th I think that is definitely the case. And I, okay, I well, that's that. I, 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 I don't. Say, I, I wouldn't assume that it's, that the ethnic background of everybody behind me is self-evident. Um, I, I wouldn't assume that the ethnic background of everybody behind you is self-evident either, but uh, I think I know an African-American when I see one. And if I see one back there, if anyone wants to stand up and volunteer <laughs> and tell me they're an African-American, I hope they will do it right now. Um, if anybody is a female that's sitting back there <laughs> and wants to stand up and volunteer to tell me that, I hope they will do it right now. Uh, and I want the record to show clearly that nobody stood up to volunteer in either one of those categories. So if you want to make that point and be cute about it, let me, let me be explicit about it, uh, Mr. Shertoff. Um, there, there, if we're going to do law enforcement in this country, um, we need to understand uh, that there is a, an element of diversity in our country that uh, I don't see represented here. I'm, I'll take your word that it's represented more uh, effectively in the, in the composition of the rest of your, um, uh, of your staff and, and move on to, to what I'd like to really ask about. Um, there's a provision um, in 8 CFR that um, uh, allows an immigration officer on a reasonable suspicion based on specific articulable facts um, to that a person being questioned is in the U.S. illegally um, to briefly detain the person for questioning. Um, um, one of the concerns that people have expressed and has been reported uh, is uh, the definition of brief and the definition of specific articulable facts apparently has gone um, escaping uh, in your enforcement efforts. Uh, in particular, um, when ICE raided Swift and Company, a meatpacking plant uh, in 2006, you detained hundreds of workers, many of them U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents. Um, um, can you tell me how you all define brief and how you uh, define what uh, articulable, specific articulable facts uh, that create a reasonable suspicion would be? I, 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 think, it's, I think it's a well-settled area of the law, uh, basically in a circumstance where you have uh, a, a reason to believe there may be a large number of undocumented workers, uh, I think the law is clear that we have the right to ask everybody in the facility uh, what their status is and to briefly question them. Now, if at that point there's reason to believe that the, uh, the answers aren't, aren't making sense and you want to inquire further, we have the, the right and the legal ability to do that. So and, and, I, and you have the right to deny them food and water and I don't contact I, with their families and union representatives well, or I'm lawyers during, the, during that brief interval. Uh, what is brief? Uh, you know, uh, uh, the courts, the law books, as you know, are full of uh, courts defining it, and I don't think there's a specific uh, amount of time that's ever been determined, like you know, two minutes or three minutes. I think the courts look at all the facts. Well, we're not talking about two or three minutes here. I, 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 I hope you're not trying to imply for the record the same thing you were trying to imply about the status of the people I'm, I'm sitting behind you. I'm uh, we're not talking about a two or three minute uh, what I'm uh, uh, detainment, Mr. Shertoff. I'm, I'm, you asked me what the definition was. The definition. Well, how long did you all re uh, detain those people? Um, I, 
I'm comfortable that the the w given the fact. Are you familiar with the case I'm that I'm talking? About? How long did you detain I, the people? I I can't give you the answer to that right now. I am comfortable that the decisions that were made based on a warrant that allowed us to do the searches and that yielded literally hundreds of undocumented workers in the course of these raids. Uh, including many who had committed identity thefts and therefore were victimizing innocent people. So you're I saying that uh, whatever you <coughs> do uh, to innocent uh, American citizens, uh, if you get uh, some illegal aliens, uh, you, you are justified no, in doing it. That's, that's, that's not what I'm saying. That's, 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 that's essentially what you're that's saying. Not, <laughs> that, I disagree. That is not essentially what I've said. What yeah. I've, what I've said is time has there expired. are well-settled legal rules we follow the legal rules, and they yield positive results. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I would turn now to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodluck. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Secretary, welcome. We are pleased to have you with us here today. I'd like to uh, change the subject over to uh, agricultural workers. And uh, I've long believed that the H-2A program has been unworkable for our nation's farmers, and it's in uh, bad need of reform from the artificially inflated adverse effect wage rate to the redundant bureaucratic hoops that farmers must jump through to comply with the program. I've been pushing legislation to make the H-2A program a realistic option for our nation's farmers, and I was glad to see that you issued regulations to grant some relief to farmers as well. As you know, farmers seeking to use the H-2A program are those who are trying to comply with our nation's immigration laws and do it the right way. Uh, would you elaborate on the ways that you have reformed the H-2A rules and how you believe they will help our nation's farmers and to what extent you can elaborate on how those rules are uh, coordinated with the Department of Labor and what they've done? Well, I think, I think uh, Congressman, as you, as you observed in the question, a lot of this really falls in the, in the domain of the Department of Labor. So, for example, they um, retool the wage rate calculation so that it is more precisely tailored to the particular geographic area and particular occupation instead of having a rate that was really not well suited for determining what the actual economic realities were. We've tried to streamline the process in terms of making it easier for workers to change jobs without having to go through the process all over again, uh, to allow employers to sign up with the program uh, with less paperwork, um, and even if they haven't specifically identified every individual worker, to grant them kind of a blanket approval so that they can then later um, supply us with the necessary information about the workers. I mean, the idea is to eliminate uh, paperwork or bureaucratic obstacles that don't really add value to the program, but have built up over time in a way that simply, as you point out, make it just inhospitable to those who want to follow the law. Thank you. I also want to uh, note your efforts to step up enforcement of uh, employer sanction laws. Uh, quite frankly, given some of the problems in some economic sectors, I think we need to see more uh, focus on this. In, in, in the meantime, I wonder what advice you would recommend that I give to constituents who are trying to play by the rules by hiring U.S. citizens and oftentimes paying higher wages to them, only to see that their businesses have been undercut by a competitor who is hiring illegal aliens to perform the same jobs. If you're in the roofing business and the guy down the street is hiring people at a lower rate who are not legally in the country and you're trying to bid to get uh, contracts, uh, that's a pretty unfair competition. I've had numerous employers contact me about this problem. and. Uh, the best advice I can give them is to contact the appropriate law enforcement authorities to have other businesses investigated. Can Th you that's give actually me that's actually great advice. You know, some of the b the biggest cases that we made uh, that resulted in <coughs> convictions and fines, as well as um, uh, locating a lot of of uh, illegal workers, <coughs> have been based on tips, and uh, therefore um, I would encourage those who are you know if they have specific um, you know, facts that suggest there is a uh, illegal activity, they do report it to the authorities. Let me, let me ask you a follow-up to that. What's the probability that when a business does that, uh, that the business that's been so identified will actually be prosecuted? It, it, you know, frankly, it depends on how good the information is. Uh, the fact that you don't like your competitor and you decide you're going to, uh, you know, make an accusation is not necessarily going to result in, in a prosecution if there's no facts. But I can tell you we have a, a, a significant number of cases, and obviously in those jurisdictions that 
um, where local law enforcement participates in the 287G program, that's a force multiplier in terms of the ability to investigate these cases. And what, uh, and w to follow up on that, what's the likelihood that the uh, illegal aliens that have been hired in these circumstances will actually be deported if they do not have previous criminal records? We've had a problem with uh, deportation proceedings uh, other than for for those who have committed serious crimes. If they've committed a minor offense or simply are illegally in the country, uh, we don't seem to get much action. It, I, I will say my experience in the last couple of years has been if we, if we apprehend them, we will get them deported. Uh, now, some of them do raise defenses or may make asylum claims. They, those generally are not successful. Um, but I will also tell you that we get, you know, we, we're fighting a legal headwind because we do have a lot of uh, groups that are resistant to the idea of deporting illegal workers, and they will, you know, take whatever legal tools available to slow up the process. But we're, we're pretty good about uh, deporting the vast majority of people that we apprehend in these kinds of operations. And are you getting increased cooperation from local law enforcement? Is your training program working to authorize them to detain those who are not legally in the country? Yes, we are. <laughs> Should we expand that program? I, we, we, we're, the budget for 09 does seek additional funds to expand the program, and I think it has worked well. And I think, frankly, what they're doing in, like, the state of Arizona, <coughs> where they're using their business licensing law, you know, reflects a very creative approach to uh, incentivizing compliance on the part of employers. The, the gentleman's you, time has expired. I would recognize now the gentle lady from California, our colleague, uh, Congresswoman. Um, Waters. Thank you very much. I wish we had more time. I thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we have a backlog of 145,250 applications um, in Los Angeles, and we have already been told that it's going to take till 2010 uh, to get the backlog uh, taken care of. I would like to have uh, from you um, a report if I may, um, Chairwoman, to uh, our committee on what and how this backlog can be uh, speeded up and how we can do better. For people who are trying to do the right thing and who've you know, gotten in line, we want to make sure that uh, we're not putting them at greater risk by not being able to uh, process their application. So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, if that could be an official request of this it, committee. It, we will officially request it, and I see the Secretary is nodding his agreement to provide that report. Thank you. Secondly, FEMA, uh, you have uh, families, I guess about 38,000 that are still living in uh, formaldehyde uh, trailers. Uh, and the response that I've heard about when they will be uh, removed and placed in safer labor, labor conditions has not been good or adequate. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, talking with the President about HUD and FEMA and others getting together and instead of continuing to spend money on trailers that are not safe, you have all this Section 8 money, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you all just build some manufactured housing and put people in? It's been, what, almost two and a half years now. What, can't you do this any better? Um, I mean, being, I, I'm, I'm delighted to answer that question, although I guess I have to observe again to the chair, and, and I think I owe this to my regular authorizers, that I think we're, we're not in the normal scope of what I would imagine. Uh, uh, we would note that this is actually beyond the scope of the Judiciary Committee, but it is an opportunity. But I, I will answer the question. Let me say this. Uh, first of all, these are not formaldehyde trailers or FEMA trailers. These are trailers sold in the open market in the United States. Um, we buy these and we bought these the same way every other American who has a trailer or a mobile home buys Do them. they have formaldehyde in them? S they have, like every other trailer. Do they have formaldehyde in them? Like then they are formaldehyde like trailers. Every, then, I don't care who every, manufactured then, them. Then I don't every, care who made them. Then every trailer and mobile home in the United States is a well, formaldehyde Well, I'm trailer. talking about FEMA now. Well, but You've no, got but families, 38,000 families in formaldehyde I, trailers. I am, I am 
more than happy to answer the question, but I need to be given the opportunity. Well, I don't want an excuse, uh, sir. I'm not giving you an excuse. I'm giving you. And I don't care about others that I don't have jurisdiction well, over. Well, I, I, I care about making very clear and straight record yeah, about what the facts are. are the, it, do you have formaldehyde Ma has it been documented? Madam Chair, I'd like the witness to be able to answer the very good questions posed by the gentlewoman from California. And I'm sure the gentleman would like to answer. I did not interfere with anybody else's, That's and I don't correct. want anybody interfering with mine. Do you have formaldehyde in the ter trailers? In every trailer, as far as I know, uh, that uh, is on the open market, there is some formaldehyde. I just want to know about the ones that FEMA has. Like with every other trailer. Okay, FEMA has yeah. formaldehyde trailers. What right. are you going to do about it? What we're doing is this, and what we've done over the last year is this. We are using every means at our disposal to urge people to leave those trailers. Uh, if people are eligible for Section 8 housing, I, uh, and assuming, again, depends on what the line is for that housing, because uh, I don't know that we can jump people ahead of the line, I'd be more than happy to, to have them go there. The response we've often gotten is people don't want to move where the Section 8 housing is. Now, you might ask, why don't we build more Section 8 housing in New Orleans? The answer is because there's litigation that is stopping HUD from doing that. And so, for, therefore, they can't build it because the courts are preventing it. I would love to see us deal with this issue. But between the legal tangles and the disagreements that individuals have about whether they want to leave the trailers, this has been a much slower process than I would like to have it be. It is unconscionable and it is shameful. I got to move on to another question. What is your plan to deal with gang members who are responsible for violence in the greater Los Angeles area who go back and forth across the border uh, and enter the country uh, and leave after they have committed murders and other kind of gang violence? Uh, first of all, I agree with you, it's a big problem. Second, we have an operation underway where we have deported more than 3,000 gang members nationally. Uh, regrettably, uh, uh, a number of them, when they go back to their home country, sneak back across the border again. That's exactly why we are building fence and getting border patrol and, and putting measures at the border. That's why we're working with the Mexican government, because they're trying to tackle organized crime on their side of the border. Uh, and I would agree with you that this, is, uh, this issue of gang members uh, and uh, organized drug gangs is one of the biggest hemispheric issues we now face. One of the things we could do is we could fund the President's Merida Initiative, which would give Mexico additional law enforcement support so they can effectively tackle the criminal <coughs> enterprise that are on that side of the border. The, the gentlelady's time has expired. We turn now to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for being here with us today, Mr. Secretary. Uh, may I just follow up on your last comment and say that uh, what we're doing on our side of the border and how we're helping work with the Mexicans uh, on their side of the border to combat the kind of crime and the violence that is proliferating there I think is remarkably important. And I appreciate uh, your involvement. <clears throat> now, my, uh, my state just uh, legislature just passed a bill that would uh, direct the uh, State Attorney General to exe execute one of these 287G agreements that would allow for local enforcement in Utah. And I, I've historically been a supporter of those agreements. We, we had a, a terrific, we continue to have a problem with drug dealers coming from Mexico, but, uh, but our U.S. attorneys have done, I think, a fairly good job of, of stanching that. Uh, some years ago, uh, we had a, a, a police chief named Ortega who wanted to do this. I was very supportive. We looked at it and, and decided in the city of Salt Lake that, that we would, they would not do it, uh, but now they're being directed. I, I would just like to hear from you uh, what the implications of that are if, if many states are directing the, their attorney generals to work with you. Uh, are, are you going to be able to handle that? Uh, what, what is, are you trying to, uh, are there things we could do to be more helpful in the process of, of combining local forces with your forces? Uh, first of all, we've asked for some more money in the 09 budget for, uh, to continue to increase this 287G process, but we also have something called ICE Access, which is a, a, what I would call 287G light. It is a way we can, even without additional money, help enable local jurisdictions uh, to assist us in, in enforcing the law, or at least know how to enforce uh, these immigration laws. One of our main concerns is this. Um, if we have people who are in custody in state and local jails, and local officials can begin the process of, of starting deportation procedures while they're in jail, 
we can essentially kill two birds with one stone. These people can serve their sentences, and then we can tee it up. So as soon as the sentence is over with, we can pick them up, stick them on an airplane, and send them back where they came from. So uh, again, you know, w w obviously it depends on getting the budget money for 09, but we want to continue to build on this, and we want to encourage local communities in this respect. Well, but the problem with that is that local communities are now going to put these guys in jail. I, I had a, a mayor who called me enraged because uh, an illegal alien who was driving drunk um, killed a couple of people in, in his town. And, and in the end of the discussion was, you have a choice. You can prosecute him and put him in jail for the crimes he's committed in your jurisdiction, or you can turn him over to ICE, in which case they'll do what, they'll prosecute the crime in, that they have jurisdiction over, which is, will result in, in deportation. And he yelled at me, that, then he'll be right back next week. And, uh, and so we have this dilemma of whether or not we put them in jail, but putting people in jail costs money. Yeah, well, I, I go, it's, it's worse dilemma. Sending them back costs money. I, I, you know, it, it would probably amaze people to reflect upon the fact that in many instances we have to pay airfares to deport people back to their home country. But with all due respect, that is federal money not coming out of a city you know, coffer. You know, as speaking as a taxpayer for a minute, it all comes out of the same pocket eventually, which is the pocket of the taxpayer. We, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The solution here is to uh, focus our attention on making it very difficult, if not impossible, for criminals to get back across the border. Well, you know, I'm sitting with Mr. King in front of me, and uh, M Mr. King made a statement on the floor uh, a few months ago, uh, which startled me, and I, I came up, he, he said that we'd only built 13 and a half miles of fence. Now, Mr. King and you and I were on the border uh, about a year ago, and, and we saw a lot of fence going up, and he, Mr. King said that he'd had 13 and a half miles of fence had only been built, and I said, How, where'd you get that number? Mr. King, and, and he emailed his office, texted his office, and said, I got, got it from DHS. And then I had my staff call DHS, and we got the same number, 13 and a half miles of fence, which I knew, and I think Steve yeah. probably agrees, was not the number of I miles of fence. I think we correct, whatever, whatever that, wherever that came from, it's been corrected. We, we, uh, we're up to th uh, 304, 305 miles. That's a lot more fence. Thank you for the correction. Is there, we, we sent you a letter suggesting that you put cameras on the border so that people could see what was happening or put maps on, on the internet so people would see where the fence was built, when it was built, and what is being built currently. Is there, you know, there's a lot of antagonisms on this point. Can we just give some information about yeah, it? Yeah, you know, that's actually a great idea. I, I, um, I'm Thank you, ask the underlings who got the letter and didn't respond. Yeah, no, I think. What happened I, to it? I think we should, I think it, it would be, um, I wa you know, obviously I, we don't want to reveal things that are gonna allow bad people to know what we're doing, but I think we could, at least in general terms, uh, maybe put on the web kind of a tracker, you know, of, of what we do in terms of miles of fencing and, and things of that sort. That might be a very interesting and useful thing to do. I, I have a bunch more questions, but I note that my time, has, time expired. has expired. Always too little time for this sort of thing, so I yield back what doesn't remain. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, is recognized um, for five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Secretary Chertoff, over the last seven years, the detention of immigrants, including the detention of children, has risen. A 2005 House Appropriations Committee report concluded that children should not be placed in government custody unless their welfare was in question and specified that DHS should release families or use alternatives to detention wherever possible. Instead of following the committee's recommendations, DHS has chosen to incarcerate children, including those of asylum seekers, in former prisons such as the Hutto Center in Texas. And this is the first time, I'll note, since the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II that families with children are being incarcerated by the U.S. government. Why has DHS resorted to incarcerating children, including those whose parents have suffered persecution in their home countries? <clears throat> well, first of all, if somebody has a legitimate claim of asylum, almost invariably they are, re are released. Now, a lot of people claim asylum that don't have a legitimate claim of asylum. It's easy to claim it. Uh, it's not so easy to substantiate. So the fact that someone has c claimed that they're entitled to asylum if, if they've been turned down does not make them a, a, a legitimate refugee. It just means that they've made a claim that's been rejected. I'll tell I you exactly that, what- but, uh, My concern is that the, uh, the recommendation is that they use alternatives to well, detention for children problem. wherever the, possible. There it, really is not- appears that that isn't, doesn't right, seem there, to be There really helpful. is not a practicable alternative in most cases because what happens is, and we actually saw this happen at the border, 
the word got out very quickly that if people pretended to be a family group, uh, they would get released, and then they wouldn't show up again for court. We get like a, I think there's like a two-third or three-quarter absconder rate. These are people who defy court orders to appear. So it's like any other system that requires people to play by the rules. I, I, I understand that, but we're talking about instances in which these are, in fact, families, and there are, in fact, children that well, are being do, but detained. But and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, and it sounds like, basically, from what you're telling me, that um, there is a plan to continue to incarcerate uh, families with children. And, and um, uh, uh, my question is, uh, will these families with children continue to be uh, detained in facilities in Hutto, or will they be in Berks County, Pennsylvania? Well, we, we use both. Um, Hutto has been re, um, uh, reconstructed or rehabilitated so that I think now even those who were originally critical of the physical setting have acknowledged that it is, it is uh, um, uh, maybe family-friendly overstates it, but it is appropriate for families. By the way, the reason that w our children are kept there is the old process was we separated children from their parents. The parents were incarcerated in one facility and the children were sent somewhere else because they obviously couldn't be left on their own. This has the, the, the I think, the better approach of keeping the families together in a more uh, appropriate facility. I, I would agree that keeping families together is probably the, the, uh, the best option. Um, but last year, DHS was sued for the deplorable conditions at the Hutto facility, including an uh, inadequate sanitation and a lack of an immunization program. Uh, and that was discovered because chicken pox had broken out in the facility. And some of the, the guards' practices at that facility included confining children to their cells for 12 hours a day without uh, crayons or anything to do. Uh, refusing to allow children to use the restroom at times, uh, waking them up in the middle of the night um, by shining lights um, at them, and threatening to separate them from their parents if they misbehaved. And I'm just wondering if you think that that's an acceptable way to treat children at these um, facilities. Well, I, I, again, I, I can't validate that, you know, what, what of those allegations are true or not true, but I do know that eventually this was resolved to the satisfaction of the plaintiffs and everybody else, and I think my understanding is that obviously people would prefer not to be apprehended, but that uh, the people who originally complained, uh, the, the lawsuit has been resolved and settled and, and everybody seems satisfied. Let me ask you this. Prior to that litigation, was DHS inspecting the facility on a yeah, regular basis? It was. It was. And yet they weren't catching these practices. You know, I, I, all I can tell you, Congresswoman, is I don't know which of these are, are accurate allegations, which are not allegations. It's not, in my experience, sometimes... Uh, allegations are exaggerated in a in a in this kind of a case. I can't judge because I wasn't there. Um, we do inspect, uh, but yet ultimately you and the department are responsible for the conditions yeah, and, and, of these detainees. And ultimately, detainees. got resolved to everybody's satisfaction. Um, my last question is: DHS has entered into more and more contracts with private companies, including Corp uh, Corrections Corporation of America, uh, to incarcerate immigrants and CCA run some of the facilities in the worst conditions, including the facilities in Hutto and San Diego. Um, do you think that private prisons are less accountable than public prisons about their daily operations? No, I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons we contract out is because our need for bed space fluctuates depending on mm -hmm. conditions in particular parts of the country. And there's no point in us building federal facilities that will be vacant. I mean, that would be a waste of the taxpayers' money. Sometimes we contract with local, county, and state facilities. Sometimes the, those uh, entities themselves contract with private facilities. Um, I, you know, I think that they're required, they're held to certain standards contractually under their, under their requirements. And I think, for example, Hutto now is actually, you know, cured some of the issues that were complained. The, the, the gentleman's time, uh, the gentlelady's time has expired. Thank I recognize you. the gentleman from California, Mr. Isa, for five minutes. I thank the chair. Uh, just like my predecessor here in questioning, I, I'll run out of time before I run out of questions. But I, I'd like to, first of all, ask the array of, of dark and light-haired people behind you, uh, are most of them political appointees? Um, probably some are and some aren't. I mean, I've got a Coast Guard uh, captain behind me who's my military aide. I've, I, the, the Ledge Affairs people, some of them are, some of them are not. Uh, we have so, some career people from CIS. So. These people, for the, va the majority of them apparently, got to the positions they are and reportable to you 
because on a merit basis they rose to the top of their selected areas that's exactly right and during my my tenure we have both in the political and in the career path elevated a very diverse group of people to leadership positions in the department well and i want to commend you on that and i want to obviously at the right time right place look into that further as appropriate but uh... you know i certainly don't want this hearing to appear as though we're disparaging people who through fifteen twenty thirty years of of service have risen uh... to these positions that somehow because of the color of their skin their merit is diminished and, and i i don't think congress meant to say that i don't think the previous people meant to say that uh... as political appointees as a member of congress i have political appointees my entire staff is at my whim and and i appreciate that i they may be disproportionately home state or in some other way uh... similar to my politics but for those who who serve not uh... at the whims of the president uh... You know, it, it, it is, it's gratifying to see that, in fact, we merit matters. Uh, I, I don't want to dwell on the, uh, uh, the issues that we've dealt with in other committees long, but isn't it true that the vast majority of the people, two and a half years later, still in trailers, are, in fact, not reporting problems with uh, formaldehyde, that that was, although regrettable, not 100 percent, and that even in the hearings that you, of course, were made aware of, uh, many people, when, when finding an unacceptable trailer, got a second trailer, and it was acceptable. Isn't that true? Well, we're, yes, and what, what is true is well, there was a range of findings, um, and I can't tell you that the, these are out of line with what you find in the industry in general. What I can tell you is last summer, I, I and the head of FEMA announced to everybody, if you don't want to be in a trailer, we will move you to someplace else. We beg people to leave trailers. Uh, people resisted leaving trailers. Um, we, we are trying even harder to get them out of trailers. Some of them don't want to leave their trailers. So uh, uh, Just starts is, charging them rent. It'll change their tune. <laughs> I mean, the, the, you know, some people, pref and particularly those who are, are in trailers on their personal property, have reasons to want to stay. I, I can't tell you there is no medically safe level for all I know, there's formaldehyde in this room. Maybe I should be asking to be tested before I come in to testify. All I can tell you is I think it's well past due to get people out of this temporary housing, and we're working very hard to do it. I appreciate that. And, and if you don't mind, to the extent that you have information that can be readily made available to the gentlelady from California and to myself, because I serve on the committee that's been looking into this, uh, the measures you're taking going forward in purchasing in the future would be appreciated because uh, uh, our hearings didn't just show formaldehyde. Obviously, they sh showed a propensity for mold and mildew and other things, which I was not shocked to find out you yeah. have in Louisiana. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, I, I have announced we're not buying trailers anymore, so that's going to take care of that problem. The issue of mobile homes is m more complex, and I might add, Many people in the United States live in mobile homes. So as we, I, I, I suggest that Congress carefully study the implications of this issue as we yeah. move forward. Now, just two more questions. The first is, uh, I'm sure you're aware that the new U.S. attorney in San Diego has, has done a, a, a huge uh, about face and is doing prosecutions of coyotes in large numbers to help with the border enforcement effort. Uh, that would be, how is that impacting border security in the San Diego area where I represent. The second one is more complex, and I think it, it directly goes to this committee's various works over the years. Many people who are in the process of gaining citizenship uh, complain about two problems. One is sometimes unaware, sometimes perhaps aware, they leave the country for a period of time that is outside of the current rules that Congress has set, and that then catch 22s them when they go to apply and they essentially reset for another seven years. If Congress took action to allow greater uh, flexibility in the process for departure from the U.S. that is not inherently contrary to their attempt to become valid U.S. citizens, would that help you? And that would be action that this committee, I believe, would have to take uh, to move it up. Last but not least, if we were, if we authorized a period of time prior to full qualification for the citizenship application, so that you had, let's say, an extra two years before their statutory period in which they can 
become citizens in other words we moved up the application date earlier than the allowing date would that also make your job more effective i realize i'm giving you three questions some of you may have to and the gentleman's time has expired so a very prompt response would be necessary criminal prosecutions and are enormously helpful they have a very very good deterrent impact and i'm i'm pleased that we're getting more of those generally speaking if we have an ability to work with Congress to clean up some of the anomalies, uh, we, would, we would welcome the opportunity to do that. Uh, you always have to be careful about unintended consequences, but I think we would welcome. Some, so we're living with some of the unfairnesses that are unintended consequences of prior reforms, and if we could clean those up, I think it would help everybody. Thank you, and I thank the gentlelady who I know is very interested in, in we, working on those I reforms. thank the gentleman, and I I hope that we can follow up on a bipartisan basis and do some improvements on the existing immigration law that in some cases are a little irrational. Um, I recognize now the uh, Mr. Cohen, the, the gentleman uh, from um, uh, Tennessee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary, on the 29th of January, a letter was addressed to you by four members of this Congress, uh, Mr. Smith, Ms. Hirona, Mr. Johnson, and myself, cons expressing concerns about the Real ID law, privacy issues, cost issues, and just the, uh, the basis of the uh, arbitrary date chosen, May 11, to punish states that haven't fallen in line with uh, the, the, the requests of the federal government. We have not received a response to this letter. Are you familiar with the letter, or uh, is, do we, should we blame the postal authorities? Well, I'm, I'm, from, I'm, I'm sure that there's a response being worked on, because uh, we've gotten much better at turning these around more quickly. But I'm certainly familiar with the issue. And um, I can tell you, as we publicly announced, we cut the cost of this program by three quarters. And as I've uh, let, let me ask you before you go on, you're sure a response is being, this has been a month and a half. Is a month and a half? The time that you're considering better does what does one of your staff members know about this it letter? It depends. It depends. One of your one of the gentlemen it does. It depends know. when it arrived. Can uh, this gentleman res tell us with the letters you know, being I, responded? I, uh, I I don't know that he's in a position to tell us. He uh, seems to think he is. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, he, he, I'm gonna lay down the law here. I if a staff member is to be called to testify, they should sit at the table and be asked to testify. I'm not gonna have. Everybody I bring into a hearing room subject to questioning. I spent too many years in a courtroom to, to let that kind of thing go on. The, the uh, witness is correct. He is the witness, and uh, the questions do need to be directed to him. He, Mr. He, Cohen, if you would Thank continue. you, Madam Chair. Uh, he may be correct, but when you don't answer a letter from four members of Congress in a month and a half, there, there's a problem. Well, we need to, the, I don't know when the letter arrived, but I would say certainly we try to turn the answers around within 30 days. So if it was sent on January 29th, by my calculation. January 23rd. January 23rd. By my calculation, depending on when it got to the department, uh, we may be slightly over 30 days, but I don't think we're much over 30 days. Why did you pick May 11 as your date? I think it's in the statute. Is, uh, you think it's in the statute? Yeah, I think, I think it is. Uh, I don't, if I'm correct, it's not, but I may be wrong. Can, does does anybody here know if that's in the is. statute? I mean, I can double check it. I'm, I, 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 can, I think it's a statutory deadline. Do you believe? I think it's based upon when the bill, original bill was passed or whatever. The Real ID law has certain issues concerning privacy. Have those issues been addressed since it was passed? I, I believe they have, and I believe that the, w the system we have worked out uh, actually eliminates, uh, it actually increases the privacy protection. This will actually be a net positive for privacy of American citizens uh, compared to where we are now. I've got a lot of questions to ask, Madam uh, Chair, but I would like to ask the Secretary if he would consult with his staff and you can answer the question if you'd be so kind. But if your staff member who has come here has the answer to the whether or not that letter is being responded to, I think it'd be pertinent. Uh, if you excuse me. Uh, I, we certainly will excuse the Secretary to consult with his staff.
Okay. Here's Mr. What Secretary? I, here's what I'm informed. I'm informed that it arrived on the 31st, and I believe the answer was signed out today. I thank you, and I look forward to the response. Let me ask you this, sir. Uh, the, uh, one of the issues and, and areas of your jurisdiction is to minimize the damage and assist in the recovery from a terrorist attack. Uh, I know that public hospitals is not under your jurisdiction. However, our public hospital system is in great danger. Uh, mine in Memphis, Tennessee, the Med, and most public hospitals through this country are not well funded. Have you thought about the need for Homeland Security to have funding possibly through Homeland Security to help see that we have a series of hospitals, public hospitals, that could be available in case of a terrorist attack? Well, I agree with you that an important part of uh, not just a terrorist attack, but a, a natural hazard, like the tornadoes we had in your area, which I was at a, a few weeks ago, or a pandemic flu, does require a surge capability from the public hospital system. Uh, that's in the domain of HHS. I, don't, I wouldn't want to be the department responsible for doling that money out because it's not our expertise area. But I, I agree that that's got to be part of the general plan. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. And <clears throat> I would remind uh, members that uh, th the best questions would be for those that are within the committee's jurisdiction and within the department's jurisdiction. And Mr. Pence is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I want to thank the Secretary for being here. I want to thank you for your service to the country. Uh, my little family sleeps a little better at night because you're the, the head of, of the Department of Homeland Security, and I mean that very sincerely. And I think that's a bipartisan view on Capitol Thank Hill. you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to bring up a topic that I think uh, I wasn't here for the ranking uh, members' remarks or the chairman, so I want to uh, defer to them, but I haven't heard other colleagues bring up uh, this issue. Uh, and we've talked about some pretty interesting topics in this hearing so far. I'd like to talk about terrorism, the threat of terrorism, and the threat of a terrorist attack on the United States of America, <laughs> which, if memory serves, is why we created this department. I, I, I know that uh, you and I have worked together on issues about immigration reform. Border security falls within the purview of the department. That's important. Uh, it, it is something of an object lesson for me to, to see um, the secretary of a department that was created to focus on protecting us from another 9-11, being questioned appropriately, members of Congress can question you on any topic, being questioned just the way any other department head would be questioned. It kind of confirms my limited government views and my general view of bureaucracy as a whole. But I'd like to focus you on that, particularly, Mr. Secretary. I was in the Kuna province of Afghanistan about 36 hours ago. Um, met with President Karzai, I met with our commanders downrange in Afghanistan and Iraq. There's extraordinary progress in Iraq, as you know well. 60% um, reduction in violence uh, uh, in Baghdad and, and uh, all over the country, actually. But m my sense is that we, we are having a great deal of success, particularly in Iraq, driving terrorist and insurgent and al-Qaeda elements out of the center part of the country. Mosul appears to be uh, still a focal point and a problem. I was there Sunday in Iraq when President Adinajab arrived and articulated almost Washington-like talking points saying that America needs to get out of Iraq. It certainly would be in his interest if America was not in Iraq. I guess my question to you as someone who I respect, I think, more than anyone other than the President on these topics is, um, the threat of uh, a spring counteroffensive in Afghanistan that is very real. The progress that, other than the political class, is not being denied by anyone, including the pages of the New York Times. Um, how does that impact our threat assessment here? Uh, it does strike me, and I, in Indiana, we you know, we, I, we identify with the view that if we're fighting them there, we're probably not going to have to fight them here. But the thought does occur, as we succeed there, is there a concern uh, in your good offices that, uh, that al-Qaeda and its patrons in places like Syria and Iran growing frustrated with their ability to project force in that region may 
be more motivated to project violence here. And I know that's somewhat counterintuitive. We, we, some of us are celebrating the progress of stability and security and political progress in Iraq. Uh, others are denying it. But, it, but regardless of that, you're, you want to be pleased about that. But it, it struck me that we have a lethal enemy who desires to do us harm. We are driving them from the center of the central front in the war on terror, which is Baghdad. And does, it, does that create, in your mind, a greater possibility of, uh, of threats <laughs> against U.S. interests abroad, embassies, the USS Cole comes to mind as a type of incident about which we should be concerned, and of course, here at home? Uh, you know, that, uh, we could, I don't want to take up the whole hearing on this. Uh, let me give you three uh, brief points in answer to that question. The Please. first is, I, I think that there has never been a a drop in the determination and the intent of the enemy to attack us here at the homeland. Okay. Al Qaeda is still, that is still to Al Qaeda in my view, uh, th that's the home run, the number one thing they want to do. The second point is they have not succeeded in doing it since 9 11, uh, largely because of the strategy, strategies we have undertaken A, to fight them over there, to put them off balance, and to keep them focused on their near term problems. And second, because of the steps we've taken to make it harder to get into this country and carry out an attack. <coughs> and, you know, of course, you see attacks and efforts in Europe, which reminds us that there's still an intent. Um, and it's certainly not that they've decided yeah. they like the United States. So it's, it's, it's what we have done to defend ourselves. The gentleman's time has expired, so if we Let could wrap just the wrap up. The third piece is this. Thanks, I think Chairman. it's terribly important to recognize that we are having a success in Iraq, which is under noticed. Uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq is really on the ropes. They have, and it's been the people that they thought were their constituency that have turned on them. That is a huge embarrassment and a problem for Al Qaeda in general because they are having trouble explaining why, if they've got you know the wind at their back and they are the wave of the future, why their own people are rejecting them. Mm. And that ultimately, in my view, makes us safe. Great. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Yes, thank you, is Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary. Uh, how many Al Qaeda in Iraq? What are the? I, I hear varying estimates in terms of numbers, anywhere from 800 to 2,000. What? Give us. Boy, I, give I, us your number. I, 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 I can't. I didn't come prepared since we kind of got off the. We're pretty well off the topic of immigration. I we are off the. Topic I'm going to get of, back into. I, I, I can't say I came prepared with a number. I don't think it's arguable, however that they, uh, and I think, you know, they pretty much admitted it, that they are, su are suffering reverses and that the, the so-called awakening or the Sunni tribes have really turned on them. Not that they're, d we're done, not that they're out of the box. A, a number I'd appreciate, a guess. I, 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 I wouldn't Okay, guess. let me get to, ter let me talk about the same subject, terrorism and threats, and when we make mistakes, okay. because we don't want we want to take steps so that we ensure that we don't make those mistakes again. And uh, Congressman Nadler indicated earlier that he and I have an interest in this case of Iraq, <laughs> Meher Iraq. And I'd like to go through the facts as I know them and end with a question and a request to you. My understanding is in September 22nd of 2000, Mr. Harah flew from Zurich to Montreal with a stopover at JFK. He was on his way back to Montreal. He was detained and interrogated for hours by New York police and along with the FBI and detained in a cell. He was then sent to a detention facility in Brooklyn where he was also interrogated for hours. An INS official informed him that they would like him to voluntarily return to Syria. He said no. He wanted to go on to Canada, where he was a citizen. When he asked for an attorney, he was told that he had no right to an attorney. On September 28th, he was given a document saying he is inadmissible under uh, Section 235 because he was a member of al-Qaeda. He continued to ask for an attorney and a phone call, but his requests were denied. 
on October 2nd, he was permitted a two-minute phone call to his mother-in-law in Ottawa, and he told her that he was afraid that they were going to send him to Syria. On the 4th of October, he had, he had a visit from the Canadian Council. He told her that he is frightened that he will be deported to Syria. She reassured him that that would not happen. On the 6th of October, he asked, he is asked why he does not want to go to Syria, and he responded that he was afraid that he would be tortured there because he didn't do his military service when he, before leaving Syria when he was a teenager, and that he is a Sunni. On October 8th, he has read a document saying that they decided, based on classified information, that they think he is a member of al-Qaeda and that the INS director has decided to send him to Syria. He protested, saying that he will be tortured there, but that is again ignored. What I would request from you, and, and Chairman Nadler indicated earlier that we've, we've forwarded a letter to you, but what I would request from you is not classified information, but simply how the decision was reached to send him to Syria rather than Canada. Maybe you have information at your disposal here. I don't presume you do. But I would appreciate your re personal review and a commitment f from you without disclosing any information that's classified as to why the decision to Syria rather than Canada. Uh, you know, I think there is an, an Inspector General report in the works on this because I think it was requested, and I don't know if it's been finalized or not. Um, I, I think that's probably going to be um, the definitive investigative um, conclusion. There is a, an Inspector General's report, my understanding, but yeah. portions of it are classified. I, what I'm looking for is something very discreet and specific. Why Syria? rather than Canada. I, I think what I'm going to have to do is, is I, now obviously you can see the classified portions. Uh, I haven't seen them, no. Um, uh, and I don't control the IG's release of this, but I presume he will show you the classified portions. Uh, the, I, the gentleman's time has expired. Again, I have so to assume the answer to the question is in that report. I mean, I could have someone extract, you know, read the report and extract it for you or direct you to the pages. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're also going to, we're ultimately going to wind up taking you back to that report uh, as the investigative well, it, uh, finding. If we may, I think the request is straightforward, and if you could respond subsequent to the hearing, that would be uh, appropriate. The gentleman from Iowa, the ranking member of the Immigration Subcommittee, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your testimony. I'd point out that uh, you have gone down and done hands-on fence construction on the border. And uh, I've watched you weld a bead on a vertical landing mat. So thank you for the hands-on portion of this. Um, on that fencing, uh, just uh, quickly, I want to touch clarification. Uh, the, the data that I have from your department is, is dated February 6th on fence construction. It concurs with your testimony. And I'm looking at that data now. It says primary pedestrian fence, 167.5 miles, identical to your testimony. Secondary fencing, I don't think you were specific on that, says 31 miles. And uh, then tertiary fencing, the triple fencing, says seven miles as of February 6th. And uh, tertiary fencing, even though uh, that may be the dinosaur era, means the triple fencing. So um, I wanted to ask you, as we looked at that fence down there in uh, San Luis, uh, south of Yuma, I asked the question there if the triple fencing had been defeated by anyone at that time. And, that, and the answer that I received from yourself and, uh, and Chief Aguilar was no, not at that point. Are you aware of any case where triple fencing has been defeated? No, um, but uh, as I said earlier in response to the question, I think a lot of times um, anything can be defeated. The question is, you know, it's like a car thing. Uh, they, they look for the car that's easiest to break into. So they, as they, they, they will move along the border, um, and as we build up in other parts, they're going to come back and take another run. But the, the key is that we are, the Border Patrol is in the area. So it's not that we, if we left it alone, people would get over it. I'd agree. What it does is it slows you up so we can get there with the Border Patrol. And in an urban area where the Border Patrol is posted, 
that gives us the ability to get people before they vanish into the town, which is what we're concerned about. So that statistically, though, uh, I understand they're not going to go through the most difficult portion. The triple fencing right. is the most difficult portion. And uh, as we continue to build that out, uh, they're going to have it raises the transaction cost of coming into the United States. It gets more difficult, uh, and that's that's the value of it, uh, in my estimation. And uh, uh, I know that the number of um, interdictions on the border has dropped over the last year. The previous year, if I remember right, was 1,188,000. I think the year before was 1,157,000. You're about 880,000. I, I recognize that uh, you view that as less border attempts mean less interdictions. But I, I will point out that we've had Border Patrol testimony before the Immigration Subcommittee in this room that has testified that they think they stop one-fourth to one-third of the attempted border crossings. I ask if you could comment on that. I, I've actually heard a different figure. The, the figure that, I, that I've heard is that basically we think we apprehend two for every one that gets in. And when I've, I've asked the question about the metrics, which is about a 20 percent decrease, I've you know, they, they look at some collateral issues, too. They look at what's going on south of the border in terms of staging areas. They look at um, they, they do some validation by, if you can believe it, literally counting the footsteps in certain areas. And uh, so when I, I'm always careful to say the 20 percent drop is not a precise figure, but I think it's um, pretty it's pretty indicative okay. of of the fact there has been a positive movement. If I could say I've been along that border a number of times and I've passed by those footsteps without them stopping to count either, and so there could well be a number that's higher than that. But I wanted to go to the to the e-verify portion of this. Uh, it hangs in front of this Congress to be addressed for reauthorization by fall. And uh, the progress that's been made there um, of new employees that are legal, uh, legal to work in the United States, 99.4 percent effectiveness, 99.9 .9 percent of native-born um, workers are authorized immediately, and the longest delay I can create in that is six seconds. So immediately is within that period of time. Um, I'm going to ask you if you'll support reauthorizing the E-Verify to make it permanent, and also to allow to be employers to utilize it for current employees as well as new employees? Uh, I, yeah, I think we would support that. Um, and uh, you know, I, obviously, we'd have to look at the details of the specific legislation. But I think, it's, I think the program has not only proven itself to be effective, but, the, but employers want it. That's why they're signing up. That's the best test of success is the marketplace. Uh, thank you. And then in my concluding question uh, is this, that um, uh, and across, it, it reflects off of what Mr. Pence uh, raised from a national security standpoint. We have had persons of interest from nations of interest that have been interdicted on all of our borders and our ports of entry, but in particular with our southern border where we have a lot of, a lot of traffic mm -hmm. across that. Can you inform this committee, and, and, and if it's unclassified, the numbers of persons who are, who are persons of interest from nations of interest who have been interdicted at the border? Uh, that number or since September 11th? Um, I can probably supply you uh, with the answer, but I need to make one thing clear. Persons of interest is different than, than, than nations of interest. <laughs> nation of interest simply means a nation that has been associated with terrorist activity or training. <laughs> uh, it does not mean necessarily that, in fact, if in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't mean that the individual is suspected of being a terrorist. The, the gentleman's time has expired. And but with that caveat, I can, we can probably get you that We will. The request is for later information. I'm advised that we are going to have a vote in about 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask uh, people to... Uh, Madam Chair, yeah. if, I, if I could just ask your indulgence, uh, I think the gentleman was within 10 seconds prepared to give me that. Oh, I thought he was answer. going to respond li with, later. Uh, we'll, with that caveat, we can provide the number. I don't have it in, off the top of my head. That's fine. Thank you. That's right. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Chairman Ch Chertoff, one of the functions of the Department of Homeland Security is the Transportation Security Administration, under whose authority uh, employees are hired at uh, various airports throughout the land to provide uh, baggage screening. And uh, these employees are on the front line in this war uh, against terrorism to make sure that we don't have another 9-11 scenario unfold with the use of planes as, as uh, offensive weapons for terrorist purposes. And what they do is screen baggage 
And uh, Mr. Secretary, I've had an opportunity to tour firsthand the security screening facilities um, at my hometown airport, which is Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport, uh, the busiest airport in the nation and the world. And uh, I think, by and large, the employees out there are doing an excellent job. However, uh, they do complain about uh, conditions, uh, employment conditions out there. Uh, they complain of uh, a culture of favoritism, uh, a culture of, uh, of uh, racism and sexism in the areas of job assignments and promotions. Uh, they complain of uh, harassment uh, when they speak out of, uh, about uh, job conditions that uh, make their job more difficult. Uh, they have uh, uh, problems with uh, the performance accountability and standard system, which is the standardized, supposed to be a standardized employee evaluation and promotion system, which uh, they say uh, is being inconsistently and arbitrarily applied. Uh, it's biased against uh, non-management employees. They talk about uh, being unable to, uh, to get the pay raises for which they have received promotions into jobs which call for pay raises. They talk of, uh, of um, problems on the job with on-the-job injuries because they're having to pick up uh, large bags for screening purposes. And uh, they talk about lost paperwork when, on their workers' comp uh, compensation claims. And they also talk about a lack of light-duty jobs that they can perform. Uh, when they are medically uh, 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 in line for a light duty job, no light duty jobs to be performed, and then they end up losing their jobs. They talk about uh, having to pay for parking, and parking at the airport is uh, is a tremendous expense, and uh, and so basically a uh, decline in morale, a bad staff morale at the airport in Atlanta, even though they're doing a trying to do as best a job as they can to keep Americans safe. My question, sir, is are the working conditions and security environment at the Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson Airport better or worse than uh, that of airports throughout the country? You know, I'm not uh, particularly familiar <coughs> with Atlanta Hartsdale, and I've, I've actually visited with screeners and I've visited at airports all over the country. Um, I can tell you that the uh, administrator of TSA, Kip Hawley, it spends a great deal of time focused on the issue of morale, and he's, first of all, we all agree the screeners do a, a remarkable job under very difficult circumstances, not least because the airports, you know, because of the congestion with air travel, the airport is not necessarily a happy place for passengers these days. Uh, some of the things he is doing is this. Um, he is broadening and expanding the career path for TSA screeners. These are federal employees, too, are, are correct. they Correct. Uh, he's talking about, for example, uh, allowing them to specialize and take training in behavioral detection uh, techniques, uh, document verification and checking techniques. This has a couple of positive benefits. First of all, it opens up the idea of being a screener as a career path where you advance these, rather than, than stay where you are. These employees certainly look at this uh, job as a place where they should be able right. to advance, and they're motivated to advance, but they feel that that's the apparatus and the process that's in place for advancement is not working, and I would employ you to uh, take a look I at it. I certainly will, and I'll raise it with Administrator Hawley. All right, thank you so much. And I'll yield back. The uh, gentleman yields back. I'd recognize the gentleman for Mr. Feeney for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chairperson. Um, uh, Secretary Chertoff, uh, Florida is a uh, great uh, tourism state. One of our concerns is the visa waiver program and other ways that people come legally to the United States. Recently, America has been branded widely throughout the world as the least attractive place to travel because of hassles and security issues. Uh, I wonder if at some point in the near future you could give us a report of how you're accommodating the need for enhanced security since September 11th, but also 
facilitating actual and reasonable ways for people that are here. It's not just tourism, it's international businesses that are deciding where to locate their business and increasingly America is an unattractive place to do business. You know, we're holding up businessmen and tourists from London um, while our border goes unsecured. So would you be willing to get an update to myself? I know Congressman Keller is interested as well and probably other members of the committee. Yeah, we can we can send you something that will explain kind of what our, our approach here is. And I, I agree with you. We, we're trying to, and the good news is we're, we keep refining our procedures so we're more able to focus on the people we want to keep out and less hindrance to the people who are, you know, legitimate travelers. Well, that's a two-pronged effort. Number one, we have to have reasonable access for people with legitimate purposes coming here. And number two, then private industries, private sector tourism folks want to go out and spread the word that we're no longer the problem we used to yeah, be. Yeah, they have to do that. But, but we have to make sure we got the problem on the front end fixed before we start bragging about it and having fixed. Uh, uh, secondly, I want to add my comments. I was uh, out for my uh, leisurely uh, four-mile run this morning when I listened to the same radio show. Prince, uh, 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 Prince William County has spent uh, $26 million of its own money uh, trying in part to apprehend and then put behind bars until you guys can come pick them up, illegals. And, um, you know, the mission statement for your department says we will lead the unified national effort to secure America. Uh, and it goes on to say later that uh, we will ensure safe and secure borders. It's hardly a unified effort if the locals that are trying to do enforcement, and this is happening in various ways throughout the country, people are terribly frustrated at the federal government's real and perceived failure to do its job to secure our borders. And I think it's a horrible message. I mean, if we can't go pick up four guys that have been apprehended, thanks to the extraordinary efforts of law enforcement, um, I, I'm really disappointed. I want to echo uh, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner's comments. With, res with respect to the border, um, Secretary Chertoff, a few years, I, I have to tell you, I came to Congress as an agnostic on immigration. There are some great things about immigration, the shining city on the hill, you know, uh, opportunity for people, uh, you know, the, the relatively inexpensive labor. There are a lot of industries that we just can't find employees for. I, I recognize all that. But after 9-11 and the, and the huge burdens on our social welfare system, education, hospital system, um, I started becoming a very quick skeptic about the job the U.S. was doing. I sat in on a question where uh, our colleague jo John Carter uh, from Texas asked uh, Mr. Rove about the problems of the totally porous border, and essentially Mr. Rove denied that there was a problem. I went um, sometime after that to Arizona, and I'm going to have my staffer, if I can, uh, give you a map and just three of a hundred photos I took down in Arizona. I'm going to also ask for permission to insert these in the record. Without objection. The map that you see, <clears throat> one of the places I visited was a place called Casa Grande, uh, north of Route 8, which is 70 miles inside the American-Arizona border. What I found there was a machine gun nest that had been occupied periodically based on a queue, and it was the 13th of a series of nests that drug and individual smugglers were using on a repeated basis. What I was disturbed and shocked to find is that Homeland Security, ICE, Border Patrol, nobody else would take me up there. They're simply not doing their job in my view, or that's what it looked like. I think Congressman King will agree with much of that. The only group doing its job when I was there is the Environmental Agency, the Bureau of Land Management. They have to clean up the mess. The cost of bringing an illegal immigrant over the border had dropped because there were these various organizations willing to do it, had dropped from about $3,000 a head to $1,500 a head. For Middle Eastern men, however, the price was about $35,000. What have you done since I visited the border Number one, to make sure that the terrorists that Steve King just talked about, but also the 12 to 20 million people that are already here are no longer be By the way, we got pictures 78 miles inside the border of uh, dope. What has been done since I was there? When were you there? Uh, this would have been three years ago. Three so I, I have to, I, I gentleman's time has expired, so we're going to have I to ask for a answer. very short monosyllabic uh, and, answer. And, and I could send you a lot as part of a long answer. I think we've transformed what we do in three years there. I think in, th in three years, in terms of tactical infrastructure, capabilities, and, and being almost doubling the Border Patrol, we've done a huge amount to change it. But here, I'm going to ask for your help. You know, as I try to build fences, I try to put this stuff up on the border, 
what I hear is I hear complaints from environmentalists that the, the fence is going to be uh, is going to interfere with the movement of some kind of an animal or something. And I say, well, wait a second. It's got to be better for the local habitat to stop drug dealers well, from coming in with drugs or, th or that, use that vehicles. I Mr. Secretary, that request is noted. We're, I'm going to move this along to the gentleman from California so Mr. Gomert will also have a chance to ask his questions. Mr. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. One of the areas that uh, I'm most concerned about in terms of our homeland security uh, is the area of nuclear terrorism. Um, and I'd like to ask you uh, what efforts the Department is making, what additional assistance you need uh, in two fronts. One, uh, in keeping nuclear material out of the country in terms of the development of the portal technology or other efforts. Um, I think probably the most significant thing we can do to protect ourselves is to prevent the wrong people from getting the material in the first place. But that's probably beyond your purview. Uh, but if you could talk about efforts we're making to keep it out of the country, I know there's been some disappointment with the, the progress of the technology. Uh, but second, I'm, I'm uh, also very concerned about the nuclear material that's already in this country. And, and really, I'm talking about the radiological material that's in our hospitals and other locations uh, that um, is too accessible and could be used for a devastating radiological attack. Uh, so if you could address in, in open session what efforts you're making, what help you need, uh, what Congress can do to assist you in those efforts. I'm, I'm happy to, Congressman. Uh, it is true that uh, the first line of defense is overseas, working with other countries uh, and through the uh, proliferation, uh, anti-proliferation security initiative to prevent the materials from getting in the hands of terrorists in the first place. Uh, and that's obviously a, a lot of that lies in the domain of other of other departments. Um, from our standpoint, obviously keeping people out who are terrorists is critical, we're, and we're doing a lot of stuff, as I've explained, about that. We are currently scanning uh, virtually 100 percent of all containers that come in from overseas for radioactive or nuclear material. That's as opposed to zero percent five years ago. That's a big step forward. We are beginning, as it was in, in announced in the paper today. We are uh, implementing a new initiative to screen uh, pi uh, crews and passengers and ultimately to scan private av aviation that comes in from overseas so people don't put a nuclear bomb on a private jet and fly it into the United States and detonate it. And that is something that we have underway, again, as a way of keeping the bad stuff out of the country. Similarly, we've got a small boat strategy that the Coast Guard is developing, uh, you know, after taking appropriate input from boaters so that we don't have people using private boats to smuggle nuclear weapons in. So we've got a comprehensive approach both to keeping dangerous people and WMD types of materials out of the country. The last piece, which you're quite right, uh, it's probably uh, under- Mr. Secretary, before you get to the radiological material, um, did you say you're screening 100% of containers coming in for nuclear Virtually material? Virtually 100%. And, and, and what kind of accuracy does, does our technology um, have? I mean, if you have nuclear material in a lead container? It, we will, it, shielding is a, is a problem. Now, we can some, now if we have a, a basis to put a, um, a container through an X-ray machine, we can detect the fact of the shielding. Um, so we have to use a combination of the scanning, which detects active radiation, and uh, also the intelligence that we have about the nature of the containers to determine which ones ought to be X-rayed as well as uh, scanned. The problem with x-raying every container is uh, you wouldn't be able to allow the driver to drive the truck through because the driver would get irradiated. So there's some technological things we're, we're addressing to try to deal with that issue. Beyond that, we're also doing some more scanning overseas. We've got three um, uh, overseas radiation scanning combined x-ray and scanning operations overseas, including in Pakistan, because we're trying to do more of this before uh, uh, the container actually even comes into the U.S. Just so I don't run out of time, um, the last piece on the radiological stuff, which is often under noticed, but you're quite right about, uh, we are beginning this year uh, and working with the medical community, uh, 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 lay, rolling out a plan to retrofit, working with the Department of Energy, existing um, medical machines that use this kind of radiological material so that it is... Uh, very much harder to remove that radiological material from the machine. And I don't want to get too specific, but the idea is over the course of the next fiscal year, 
we will retrofit machines that use a certain kind of radioactive material so that you can't just take the, the material out. And, and do you have the resources to do that, or do you need us to work on that? Um, we, we do. I think we do have the resources. I mean, frankly, the, the, uh, the companies that actually do this are going to have to um, do the work. It'll, the cost per machine is pretty modest, so I think it can be handled uh, by the hospitals themselves. We're also partnering with the Department of Energy. So I think we have the authorities. We do have money in the budget for this. So we, have, we are funding some, you know, the necessary part on our end. And just to complete the answer, we're trying to work with the industry to actually the, the, move the gentleman's them, time has expired. Move them to a different kind of uh, radiological material that is not susceptible of being made into a weapon. That's the more long-term solution. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Before going to the uh, ranking member, I can uh, give you more information. Member, I, I appreciate it. Uh, Madam I, Trick, I'm can going I to just do say for 10 seconds that I want to well, echo the chair's concerns. Uh, on the issue of how long it's taking to get background checks for people right. applying for citizenship. We're going to take a brief detour here on something that the ranking member and chairman have agreed on. The committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recess. Our business this morning is adoption of the resolution to establish a task force on competition policy and antitrust laws. Everyone has a copy of the resolution without objection. The resolution will be considered as read and open for amendment. Without objection, the chair's opening statement will be inserted in a record. The task force uh, that we are reauthorizing will have a lifespan of six months. Uh, the question is on adoption of the resolution. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. And we are now recognizing Mr. Gohmert for his. Uh, uh, there being no further business for the committee, the markup is adjourned, and we return to the hearing and recognize Mr. Uh, Gohmert for his five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so many questions, a little time. Thanks for your vigilance, uh, Secretary. Uh, I'm following up Ms. Feeney's question and Ms. Sinsmer. Uh, this is an ongoing problem where local law enforcement is willing to pick people up. They do pick, pick people up. They can't afford to not only do the federal government's job in picking them up, but then also pay for detention until they're removed. Is there any way that if they pick them up and they hold them that they can be compensated, sometimes $50 a day to hold them, until Homeland Security <laughs> can pick them up, ICE can pick them up and remove them? I think the 287G program does have some provision. But you know 287G has so many requirements and, and, and so many requirements yeah. for training and additional cost to local community. And then I think there, there was a program on, on um, paying for criminal aliens, which is run out of the Justice Department, uh, you know, and that's a budget issue, to be honest with you. Well, I understand, but it, that's why I'm asking, can you well, help so out I mean, with the local whatever is Whatever is available, I can't speak to their budget. Uh, it's not my department, and I, I don't know what the budget is. Is ICE under you? ICE is, but, but this, I think the reimbursement for um, uh, jails and, and prisons comes under DOJ. It does not come out of ICE. Well, we got a lot of local law enforcement that's doing the federal job, and, and uh, they're willing to do it, as we see here, uh, but they need some help in reimbursement for uh, holding people. Let me move on since um, we don't have a good answer there, but on Real ID Act, you know, that's been demonized in a lot of ways, but those of us supported it, uh, supported believe in states' rights. The state has a right to decide who uses their highways, but it can also, uh, as the federal government, we also have the right to say who gets on uh, uh, transportation and interstate commerce. So in order that be received, then they, it's got to be a state ID or, or driver's license where we don't just, the states don't just hand it out to anybody illegally here. What I know there's also a great fear of a national ID card and trying to consider that and also meet the needs of ensuring uh, immigrants that are here legally can be properly identified. I was wondering about observing the state's rights by saying, okay, you, you decide who gets a driver's license but you got to meet these requirements. I was wondering about adding an amendment to the Real ID Act to require those driver's licenses also have a place on them that indicates that someone is a U.S. citizen or U.S. national, yes or no, and if the answer is no, then have a tamper-proof card that you have to furnish as an immigrant legally here. What do you think about uh, that mean, possibility? Uh, well, the, the real ID license is only available if you're here in the country lawfully. And the idea is if you're here on a temporary basis lawfully, it has to expire at the end of your That's period. correct. As 
between distinguishing between U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents, I'm, I'm actually not sure that that's legal to do, uh, even constitutionally. So, I, and I, I'm not sure that we ought to distinguish between legal permanent residents and citizens on the on the license, since both are here. No, it no, it would be U.S. nationals and U.S. citizens, yes or no. If the answer is no, then you'd have to have a tamper-proof card to show that you were lawfully here as a legal immigrant mm. who was not a citizen or a national. We're not going to discriminate between nationals and citizens, but we do require that you have a green card. I don't yeah. think that's discriminating I, 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 under I, the Constitution. I think from a practical standpoint, um, you know, adding another document, uh, I don't, I don't know if it would make. If it We're would. not adding another document. We need to have a, a green card that's not, uh, it, that's tamper proof. I agree. The green card should be tamper proof. We're trying to actually. We now in, uh, issue a better quality. We're, we're, there's a whole debate about whether we should recall the old ones and transition to the new ones. Uh, so the short answer is, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I agree in principle with your idea that we ought to move forward with this. I want to make sure we don't make what has already turned out to be a very complicated thing. That's what I'm trying to simplify. Thing. I don't want to make it more complicated, more contentious by introducing new uh, requirements because I'm afraid that's going to set us back. Well, you can't require somebody to produce a green card or a tamper-proof card if they're a U.S. citizen or U.S. Right. national. Right. Well, how do you know? Everybody would say, well, I'm a U.S. citizen or U.S. national. If they have a state driver's license that says they're a citizen or national, uh, then that should yeah, take I mean, care of that. I understand your point. I mean, I could reflect on it. I, I well, I'm trying to simplify. Well, I see my time's running out. Uh, let me ask this real quickly. We had a Border Patrol agent who was following some illegals by airplane, and all of a sudden just crashed. There were people back in Henderson, Texas, that are concerned he was shot down, but nobody that they know of has ever been allowed to see the airplane. Would I be able to see the airplane to see if there's I'm bullet holes? I'm with an incident where someone was following illegals with an airplane. We have had some helicopters. Well, I, I know it happened. I went to the funeral. So anyway, I wondered if I might be able to see I, the I, airplane. I'd have remains. to find out about that. I, I can't answer. I don't know where. So where a member of Congress may not be allowed to see the, the I don't, I, airplane. I, I, you're catching me about something I know nothing about, so I'd have to find out about it. Okay, so <laughs> that doesn't give me a lot of encouragement. Looks like we need a hearing on that. Uh, as far as adjudicators, have we increased the number of adjudicators with proper security clearance so that we can move things? I got yeah, a guy that's are. been waiting for since 1996 yeah. to get but lawful status a, here. That's not a problem with the number of adjudicators. There are problems yeah. with background. The, the gentleman's time has we're, we're expired. We're, the answer is we're dealing with both. We're hiring more adjudicators, and we are working to... But, be more efficient on the background. We have Thanks. four minutes left until the vote is called on the floor. We have two members that want to ask questions, so I'm going to, I think by agreement, each will get two minutes and submit the rest of their questions in writing. Sheila Jackson, please recognize for two minutes. Madam Chair, let me thank you for indulgence. This is difficult um, uh, when we have uh, votes, and I apologize for being delayed in my district. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to repeat and ask for you to have these questions in writing. I am concerned about the uh, Hutu facility that is actually in uh, Texas uh, to give me uh, precise answers about uh, waking up children with flashlights. You may not be aware of it, but we should get something on, on response. We've been following this for a couple of years. The other is I want to ensure, um, let me just ask a specific question. Do you know the average tenure of ICE agents? Check on it, please. Uh, not offhand. Uh, what I'd like to weave that into is retention and training. Um, because we know that their job is difficult, it's been made more difficult because of the, in essence, heat of trying to use them to have immigration reform when we should really have laws. So they're finding themselves invading uh, uh, frightened civilians who have no interest in terrorizing us. And of course, uh, it is uh, in many instances very hostile. I'd like to know about their retention and training, yeah, if you would, if you don't know the answer. The other question I'd ask is, what is the policy for providing life-saving medications to those who are held in detention? We're finding that that is uh, particularly a problem. The policy is to do it. It's, I'm sorry. The policy is we do obviously provide life-saving medicine to people in detention. And my last one, if you can do in writing, is I, I do think that even though it is the FBI, you need to give us a response on what efforts are being made, whether you put in a classified form, 
what efforts are being made on this waiting list? Yeah. It is we torturous. It is it is destroying people's lives. And it's very frustrating for us, too. And uh, we, we have actually spent a lot of time tackling this issue, so we can give that to you. We will get a report in writing on that. Thank you. And I have other questions I'll submit in the record. Thank, thank you, Madam you. Chair. Uh, Mr. Franks is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I had the privilege, as you know, of traveling with you to the President down to the Arizona border and witnessed uh, this double fence that was being built there and was convinced that this was a, a very, very effective mechanism. Um, and so uh, my greatest concern, Mr. Secretary, is very simple. Uh, outside of immigration, I'm concerned about the national security component uh, and that, uh, that the border is probably terrorist most um, available means to penetrate this country. With that said, um, do you know, sir, and, and this may have to, to be answered later, do you know, sir, if uh, the, 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 the double fence uh, with the surveillance and the uh, road between them has ever been breached by any? Uh, uh oh, I think it has. I think the double fence with the road has been breached. And we've <coughs> had people, just recently what they did is they tied a wire across the double fence and when you pulled it tight, it would be at the level of the neck of a Border Patrol agent riding on an ATV, and it would take his head off. So obviously they got through it. They, they put up this booby trap in the double fence, and we were lucky that we found it. Before All right. What I'd, I'd like, just for the record, maybe you could uh, uh, give us examples of when the, the double fence, as, it was be as it's being built in Arizona now, with the sheet steel going four feet into the ground so that it can't be tunneled under very easily, oh, they, uh, being I, I, branched, I, if, if, you, if you do that, because I, I think that's a pretty effective mechanism. But again, my great concern is the, uh, the stopping terrorists at the border. What do you think is our greatest vulnerability um, as, as far as terrorists being able to come in, either hit this country with a nuclear capability or with uh, uh, other weapons of mass destruction. I, I think in the short, I think, I think the greatest vulnerability right now is private aircraft. Somebody flying a private aircraft from overseas with a nuclear bomb, and they wouldn't even land; they just detonate it. Yeah. That's why we are in the process of requiring new and stringent security measures for uh, private aircraft. That's a, that's a good answer, Mr. Secretary. Last question. What do you need from us more than anything else to protect this country? Uh, I, I need the continued support of Congress for measures like Real ID Act, like Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, secure documentation, a continued support for building the, the low-tech and the high-tech uh, at the border, continued support for hiring Border Patrol and ICE, you know, that's the, in my department. And thank so you for all your good The work, gentleman, sir. I was excited, Mr. Secretary, we appreciate your presence here today. Uh, we, many members have additional questions. We will forward those questions that are within the committee's jurisdiction to you. And I would ask that, if at all possible, that the answers, we're only going to send questions to you that, that are important to us, that the answers be prepared and promptly uh, responded to if that we would will. be possible. Sure. And uh, with that, this hearing is uh, adjourned. Thank you very much.